Riding from Mysore, yes, good. And where are you, uh, Sundarajan? Uh, I am in Bangalore. Bangalore, okay. Yeah. Good afternoon, Dr. Yeah. Grover. Good afternoon. Yes, here, sir. Oh, <laughs> I am in the council, sir. council yeah. room, sir. Council hall. I was looking at the names there. Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> Along with Professor Vasudev Rao. <laughs> yes, yes. Good. Interesting topic. Yes. Good afternoon to all. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Clover, sir, Murthy, sir, Gad, sir. Good afternoon. 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 Good start yes still have oh he says he can't hear it yes Dr. yes martin uh, says he can't hear it i cannot hear anything is it normal Anurag may have to oh. unmute her. Can we request uh, everyone to mute their mics? Uh, we will start the meeting in a couple of minutes. Ah, yes. Thank you. Go there. Go down. Professor Martin is unable to hear us. Yes. Yes. Where is that? You can the echo pulse. Where is that, sir? You have no, to send yes. a, a written message to, to reconnect. Yeah. yeah. He is unmuted. Now, Professor Martins has joined. So, yes, to unmute for me. Professor Martins, can you hear me? No? Good afternoon to everybody who has joined. Uh, uh, please wait for just one or two minutes. We are waiting for our Chancellor, Dr. Banerjee, to join the program.
Dr. Martens, can you confirm whether you are able to hear us? We just want to confirm that we are able to communicate. Dr. Martens? Yes, he still cannot hear anything. But we cannot see this yet. Uh, I can I can finally hear you. Can you hear me? Oh yes, yes I can yes. hear you. Can hear, yeah. Oh good, good. Oh, good, good. Okay, I hope uh, we are able to load your presentation also. Her presentation also is good too. I, I think we can try to do it like we did last time. It worked fine in the end. Yes, I think so. Uh, we will try the presentation. Anyway, thank you for sending us and uh, we will load it from here if that is required. Okay. Okay. Okay, fine. Thank you. Okay, sir, shall I start? Okay, I think we can start. Very good afternoon to one and all. Respected Sri K. N. Bias, Chairman AEC and Secretary DAE, Professor S. Banerjee, Chancellor HBNI, Professor R. B. Grover, Professor Basudev Rao, Professor Lopez Martins, Dr. Venugopal, Dr. A. R. Sundarajan, Professor P.G. Naik, distinguished invitees to this function, life members of ANCAS and other scientific organizations, colleagues from BARC and other CIOCC of HBNI, dear students, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Indian Association of Nuclear Chemists and Allied Scientists, ANCAS, and Homi Bhava National Institute, I extend a warm welcome to all in this function which is being organized to commemorate the 125 years of the discovery of radioactivity by Henry Becquerel on this very day, March 1, 1896. Though the discovery was accidental, the scientific brilliance of Henry Becquerel in carrying out experiments with different chemical forms of uranium towards interpreting the observations lead to this discovery is equally noteworthy. This shows that any experimental observation has to be interpreted after careful examination of all aspects based on sound scientific methodology. This is particularly relevant today when we have a glut of information on almost every subject in the virtual world and one is tempted to selectively take this interpretation which suits the experimenter's thought process. The discovery of radioactivity paved the way for its applications in various fields from astronomy, geology, archaeology, to modern day social well-being of human race. However, these applications need to be spread to society. In this endeavor, 
ANCAS has been contributing significantly in popularizing the subject of radioactivity among the school students by conducting one day school workshops for students of 9th to 12th standard in schools in and around Mumbai. As a part of these workshops, simple experiments like working of a GM counter and half life determination of 137M barium by milking it from 137 CGM column are demonstrated. ANCAS also conducts six days national workshops on radiochemistry and applications of radioisotopes for postgraduate students, such scholars, and faculty in various disciplines in different universities and colleges to encourage them towards using radioisotopes in their field of research. So far, we have conducted more than 100 workshops during the last 40 years, that is since its inception in 1980. In fact, after the workshop, we donate a pair of GM counter and sodium iodide thallium counter to the host institute so that the participants can use them in their research work in future. All this has been possible thanks to the grants received from the Board of Research in Nuclear Sciences, DRNS BAE. We thank our chairman and chairman BARNS for this support. ANCAS has right now 1,800 life members from all over the country and abroad. We also publish thematic bulletins on subjects related to nuclear science and technology, and so far 65 such bulletins have, have been published. Most of these bulletins are available in, to viewers in our website, www.iancast.org.in. In addition, ANCAS also gives awards to senior and young radio chemists in the memory of our founding fathers and young achievers. These are Dr. M. V. Ramaniya, Lifetime Achievement Award, Professor H. J. Arnikar, Guest Thesis Award, and Dr. Tarundatta Memorial Young Science Award. All the above endeavors have been towards encouraging young researchers in taking up nuclear science in their research work. And I'm sure this webinar will add to that endeavor. Once again, I heartily welcome to uh, one and all in this webinar. Thank you. May I now request our chairman, Sri K. N. Vyas, to deliver the presidential address. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tomar. Respected uh, dignitaries present in physical as well as virtual mode, Dr. Banerjee, Chancellor HBNI and former Chairman, Atomic Energy Commission, Professor Grover, Professor Martens, who has taken trouble of joining all the way rather early in the morning, possibly from Sakle, Professor Vasudev Rao, Vice Chancellor HBNI, uh, Dr. Venugopal, former Director RCIG, Dr. Sundarajan, former Head Radi uh, Radiation Safety Division, Professor Grover, Dr. Uh, P. D. Nayak, and so many others who have joined uh, today uh, in virtual mode, ladies and gentlemen. The world today is celebrating the 125th anniversary of the discovery of radioactivity, and it is quite appropriate that Humi Baba National Institute and Indian Association of Nuclear Chemists and Allied Scientists have organized an event to commemorate this momentous discovery. Radioactivity has led to path-breaking applications of immense societal benefits in the spheres of power, agriculture, medicine, food preservation, and many other areas. Department of Atomic Energy has been the torch bearer for this cause in India with major contributions in almost all sectors, and it therefore gives me great pleasure to be present in this gathering on this very special day. I must admit here that my introduction to radiochemistry happened rather late in my life, and I am thankful for that to Dr. Venugopal and two of his colleagues, uh, Dr. A. V. R. Reddy and Mr. Newton, who uh, helped me in understanding finer aspects of radiochemistry. As we all know, radioactivity, though discovered only 125 years ago, occurs in nature and is an omnipresent component of this universe. This hidden secret of nature was eventually unraveled in 1896 when Henry Becquerel accidentally discovered emissions from uranium salts. It galvanized him 
and subsequently the curies both mary and pierre into a chain of experiments eventually leading to the discovery of radioactivity they jointly received the physics nobel prize in 1903 for the discovery this is one of the classical cases which shows unrelenting curiosity and desire to understand the mysteries of nature exhibited by all great scientists as a fitting tribute to their invaluable contributions the units of radioactivity are rightfully named curie and becquerel there are many lessons to be drawn from the saga of discovery of radioactivity the importance of being observant and follow up on all leads the necessity of perseverance and hard work the need to quickly report the findings accurately and honestly the ethical practice of sharing credit and information a curiosity and thirst for new knowledge and discoveries and above all putting the putting in collaborative efforts the explosion of science that occurred thereafter catalyzed catalyzed by this discovery is unprecedented in the annals of science the period from early 20th century and subsequent 30 to 40 years can be described as the golden period for science associated with the fields of understanding the nuclear and atomic structures the period has seen greats like enrico fermi ernest rutherford albert einstein leo szilard niels bohr james chadwick the list is really very long we are in a different era now the era of big science high tech equipment and large teams but the basic tenets which i mentioned before namely curiosity perseverance and honesty of purpose in my view remain unchanged and should be considered as the key takeaways before i end i must pay my tributes to madam curie who can be a role model for any aspiring researcher she continued her untiring efforts despite facing enormous barriers due, due to gender discrimination of that era she remarkably went on to win a second nobel in chemistry this time she was the first woman to win a nobel only woman to win nobel prize in two fields and the only person to win the nobel prizes in two different fields of science despite being extremely busy with her research madam curie used her scientific acumen to fabricate mobile radiography units during the first world war for quick diagnosis of wounded soldiers i would like to end by paraphrasing quotes by madam curie which sum up the scientific spirit of her era and should be guiding principle for all scientific endeavors i would i, I wouldn't say that i quote but i sort of i quote her in a, indirectly science has great beauty a scientist in the laboratory is not only a researcher but also a child plays before natural phenomenon which impress him or her like a fairy tale another quote from her the way of progress is neither swift nor easy we must have perseverance and above all confidence in ourselves and at the end humanity will draw more good than evil from new discoveries thank you very much and jai hind thank you sri vyas for your the insightful remarks in fact many lessons that can be learned from the story of radioactivity and many important qualities of the scientists you have briefed in a very concise manner and this will be dealt with to some extent in my presentation uh, mr anurag can you load, load my presentation please so good afternoon uh, everybody uh, dr banerji chancellor hbni Shri K N Vyas, Chairman Atomic Energy Commission, Secretary D A E, and Chairman Council of Management of H B N I. My fellow speakers, Dr. Martens, Dr. Venu Gopal, Sri Sundar Rajan, President Ian Kas, Professor Tomar, and other colleagues here. A good, very good afternoon to all of you. I will be sharing my thoughts on historical aspects of the discovery of radioactivity. i am fond of the subject uh, of uh, science history in general that is uh, not only because it is uh, inspiring but uh, i also believe in my present role that science history has a lot of lessons for the researchers and so that therefore in addition to learning about science and technology which they do anyway as part of their curriculum i always urge our researchers 
that they should also study science history and i hope to enjoy in the next uh, 30 minutes with you the historical aspects of the discovery of radioactivity while looking now and then at the lessons that we can learn from this events next slide one thing which you will read which you will find in every uh, every other article about discovery of radioactivity is the claim that it's an accidental discovery i want to deal with that first for example on the right side i find the i find the uh, uh, statement from the nobel Pre website itself it says by accident he discovered that uranium salts spontaneously emit a penetrating radiation on the left side you find the, the news of the american the aps news website where again it says in one of the most well known accidental discoveries of all times and so on so it is generally thought that uh, this discovery of radioactivity by becquerel was accidental and my first aim would be to show that it's really not so in that uh, in real sense of the world word henry becquerel was born in uh, 1852 and in his 44th year he made the discovery that uh, totally shook up the world we know we know it shook up science launched a whole new domain of research and development which has made immense difference to all of us finally we today we are producing energy from the nucleus with, and it was started with the discovery of radioactivity can i go to next slide to explain about uh, this aspect i want to quote from a very very interesting article which i have read which is titled as usefulness of useless knowledge i was really intrigued by this title and this appeared as early as 1939 and he very nicely explains that almost every discovery has a long and precarious history if we imagine that it has happened in one moment it is not correct someone finds a bit here another a bit there a third a step succeeds later and thus onward till a genius pieces the bits together and makes the decisive contribution and he gives a beautiful example science is like the mississippi river it begins in a tiny rivulet in a dense forest and the roaring river that you always see actually is formed from countless very small rivulets and we are very often we don't see those rivulets we see the river and we imagine that this is how it is next slide now to come to the story of radioactivity actually it begins sometime in the beginning of 19th century this is what i meant by saying that it's not that accident accidental as we think uh, i am here talking about uh, the name i could i hope i can pronounce it properly but i can let me say he saint victor he lived between 1805 to 1870 he was among the first persons he is a real uh, you know specialist in photography he produced he was the first person to produce silver iodide uh, in you know immobilized the matrix of albumin and starch for use with photography the, the way we, we think of photography now as fixing a you know figure in some matrix it started with him and in the 1850s he was trying to develop color photography using light sensitive metal salts and beginning in 1857 and long before becquerel's discovery he had observed that even in complete darkness certain salts could expose photographic emulsions and he soon realized that uranium salts were responsible for this anomalous phenomenon and when he reported these photographs photographers in france england germany many other places soon confirmed his findings he recognized that the light was exposing his photographic plates was neither conventional for phosphorescence nor fluorescence the salts could expose photographic plates long after the salts had been exposed to sunlight and in 1861 he clearly stated that uranium salts emitted some sort of radiation that was invisible to the human eye and interestingly in that article he mentions edmund becquerel who was the father of becquerel this persistent activity cannot be due to phosphorescence for it would not last so long according to the experiments of mr edmund becquerel it is thus more likely that it's a radiation that's invisible to our eyes and this you can find this article in computer renders of the year 1861 but then uh, I, in fact later on edmund becquerel published a book in which he mentioned this uh, saint victor's uh, findings so one would think that this uh, kind of very very strange radiation was well known right in the beginning of 19th century but it was not well understood no systematic work was carried out this knowledge soon faded away and uh, it was not a area of exciting work till 
ranjan came in to understand what was the situation at ranjan's time we need to think about the scenario in the 1890s and i want to quote two statements albert michelson who was the first person to win the nobel prize from us he won it in 1907 a great physicist known for his work on interferometry he said at that time i think it was in 1894 he mentioned this while it is never safe to affirm that the future of physical science has no marvels in store mr anurag can you go to next slide it seems probable that most of the grand underlying principles have been firmly established he thought that there is nothing more for people to do everything is known now an eminent physicist has remarked that the future truths of physical science are to be looked in for in the sixth place of the decimal all you can do is just to improve the data well if it is velocity of light or velocity of sound you can just add to another decimal that's all he can do and this is a person who was a very very eminent scientific physicist later on who won the nobel prize and if you go to the library of brc you will find an excellent book by kris and man titled the second creation which mentions professor trobridge who was the head of the physics department of harvard university in the late uh, 1890s he was telling his students bright students please go away from physics because only minor problems are left which can be handled by second rate fellows you want to do something you need not do physics it such was the complacency at that point of time till ranjan came up with that great discovery next slide please and that uh, event started it all complete shake up of science of course some people as i mentioned before they had been reporting very bizarre things when they electrified thin gas in vacuum tubes here again this uh, one can look at it as a fallout of the study on vacuum tubes in fact many people have mentioned that but for the discovery of vacuum tubes radioactivity may not have been discovered while experimenting back with vacuum tubes they found very strange radiation and we know the story i don't want to discuss that because that is not the theme of today's meeting we know that on the sunday before the christmas 1895 ranjan invited his wife bertha into the laboratory and took took a shadow graph of the bones of her hand and her wedding ring clearly visible and this photograph was uh, so so famous at that point of time it was circulated all over the world it became one of the most famous images in photographic history and the the studies and use of x rays caught up like wildfire among all scientists and other practitioners and uh, what you see on the right side is not that photograph but what i am showing here is the photograph of the right hand of albert kolikar this was made when ranjan gave a lecture on radioactivity on 23rd january it was so exciting that several people came forward to show, show their hands to take photograph and it demonstrated live that you can take such a photograph with x rays can you go to next slide now let's come to becquerel as i mentioned it i would not think it's an accidental discovery because i believe becquerel was the right man at the right time in history he had a great tradition first let us look at that his grandfather antoine caesar uh, becquerel he was a professor of physics at the museum of natural history at paris since 1838 and his father edmund becquerel he succeeded his father when he passed away in 1878 again as professor of physics and henry becquerel succeeded edmund becquerel in 1891 when he passed away and his son jean succeed jean or sean i do not know who pronounce it he succeeded henry after his death in 1908 he continued as professor of physics in until 1948 now you can see becquerel's family occupied the position of professor of physics in the M- M- museum of natural history considered to be one of the great institutions in paris continuously for 110 years so there was a great tradition of research and if uh, if you go further you will find all of them were experts in phosphorescence and fluorescence so it's not that you know for becquerel it was a new subject at all next slide So his uh, henry's father and grandfather had studied luminescence phenomena including that of uranium salts and his father edmund becquerel was a leading authority of europe in fact in the subject of uh, phosphorescence of solids and he did con- make an important contribution that the uranic series of salts uranyl nitrate or whatever though they they exhibit phosphorescence but the uranus salts do not this was the father's observation so henry started publishing on phosphorescence quite early in 1883 so already he had an experience with phosphorescence for about 10 years and after mendeley formulated the periodic table and in 1896 and showed uranium 
as the heaviest element his the, the interest grow in uranium and it was used for several applications and particularly in coloring glasses so uranium again was not a strange thing so phosphorescence was not strange he had a background he knew about uranium he was experiment with uranium experimenting with uranium in the late in late 1890s next slide so what were the events that led to the discovery henry becquerel was a member of the french academy of sciences and he was very keen to attend every meeting and on 20th january 1896 mathematician and astronomer jules henry poincare poincare was a very unique person he is a great uh, mathematician and he knew german therefore when ronjan had uh, circulated his photographs and notes to several people poincare was one of them who received it and since he understood german he got really excited about uh, the topic of x-rays so he point circulated an x-ray photograph which he received from ronjan in that meeting and becquerel happened to attend that then becquerel questioned him what is it uh, what is it that can do what is the region from where the x-rays are emitted on point care indicated that the invisible radiation seemed to originate from the area made fluorescent by the cathode rays in the cathode ray tube wherever the electrons are hitting the glass from there you find some kind of phosphorescent probably from that location so it uh, point care started wondering whether such radiation was also emitted by other luminescent bodies and this statement was the one which triggered the interest of becquerel and he began a series of uh, systematic investigations uh, after this because he knew uranium he knew phosphorescence and this topic was very interesting next slide now henry poincare within another 10 days he published a semi popular article which attracted the attention of many people in that article i have mentioned the source below it's a, a great uh, article by uh, oliver lodge who gave a becquerel memorial lecture in 1912 Uh, organized by the chemical physics so- chemical society of london he said thus it is a glass which emits the rays and it emits them by becoming fluorescent maybe not therefore ask whether all bodies whose fluorescence is sufficiently intense they may also give out x rays of ronjan well this question was really stimulating and when, for me what is interesting is we start with henry poincare and we come to henry becquerel and the third person who seals the limit is henry moisson who later on uh, found out the way to make uranium metal he comes in the story little later so maybe one can call it as a story of three henrys next slide now based on this henry becquerel started very systematic investigations on the phenomenon of phosphorescence of phosphorescence of certain bodies and whether they emitted invisible radiation he used to wrap photograph paper in light tight black paper placed the mineral or chemical on this and kept the kit on the windows window sill so that it could receive sunshine and sometimes he kept coins or some other objects under the crystals and on 24th february 1896 he gave a lecture at the academy radiation produced by phosphorescence in which he reported a number of materials which he kept on the window sill they had been simulated by sunlight and they were producing radiation that was exposing the photographic plates even when it was covered by black paper and he continued his work during the following week using several things including tin copper aluminum plates one can see what one needs to understand is a systematic and continuous work on this that led him to the conclusion about radioactivity but what happened was on 26th and 27th february the weather in paris was very cloudy and uh, he thought that maybe the samples cannot get exposed to sunlight so he pre- even though he had prepared several plates he put them inside the drawer and simply left it there thought that we'll stop the experiment we'll wait for the sun- sunshine to come back but on sunday on 1st march he came to the lab something made him even that day sunlight was not very good but something made him take out those plates and see why not we expose this and see what has happened and he was surprised to find that they were heavily fogged and therefore this is the reason why that day 1st march 1896 is uh, associated with the discovery of radioactivity not because it was understood what what happened what was happening it was the day of the observation well becquerel also tried several phosphor phosphorescent compounds not only uranium compounds several chemicals such as calcium fluoride zinc sulfide etc some of the compounds he took them exposed them to uh, electric sparks 
and uh, one wanted to see whether they will get excited and emit this kind of radiation uh, but he had given uranyl sulfate potassium uranyl sulfate he had with him he had given it to henry moisson and for some time he had to wait for that to come and once he received it the same day he made this observation that potassium uranyl sulfate is really special and it emits uh, radiation that can pass through the black plates next slide we see the photograph of uh, henry becquerel in his uh, laboratory on the left side and on the right side the great uh, you know, epoch making film uh, blackening that uh, proved the existence of spontaneous radiation from uranium but uh, question next question i always asked is uh, why did he go to they check the plates on march 1st a sunday i found uh, several articles on this several people have given several reasons nothing is known because uh, i could not find a biography of becquerel where he explains this but very likely what the many people have conjectured is that there was an academy meeting on second and becquerel was a very you no know, active member of the academy he wanted to give them an update on what has happened in the last one week so i thought he thought that on first he will go to the laboratory and check uh, what has happened to those plates that is as simple as that next slide he repeated the experiment which he saw earlier in a dark room with the uranium uranium salt potassium uranium sulfate using a new plate wait that waited for 5 hours and then found the explosion and therefore on march 2nd monday for the first time he reported to the academy on invisible radiation emitted by phosphorescent substance and then he conducted several experiments to find out whether any light simulation is required at all he got a doubt we it would could a clouded day could uh, produce this so suppose i keep it in dark so he placed several samples of minerals over covered photographic plates in opaque cardboard box and after several hours the plate showed once again significant exposure and which meant that something was happening not connected with uh, the exposure to sunlight at all next slide so through march 1896 so the earlier earliest observation was on 1st march 1896 but throughout the month and in several months he continued his studies on several phosphorescent compounds and finally he conclu- concluded he first concluded that the observations can be explained by long lived phosphorescence even at this point he never thought of anything atomic in nature anything that is coming from nucleus etc nucleus was not known at that point of time he he still thought of some chemical phenomenon he felt that the phosphorescence was so long lived that even after one week it was fogging the plates or that is associated with phosphorescence but he found that the penetrating rays could discharge a gold leaf electroscope and this turned the chapter once again now that he could see an electrical effect not only passing through a paper and exposing a photographic plate the electrical effect was seen and this gave a more quantitative explanation of the phenomenon and then he could find that even uranium compounds which are not connected with phosphorescence including uranyl uranyl sulfate and finally uranium metal which was given by henry moisson to him that was the final point when he decided that this fogging of plates was connected with uranium and not just its phosphorescence and he used the term uranic rays in his paper which was presented to academy in november 1896 of course even at this point he did not ascribe the radiation to the atomic phenomenon next slide so this is summarized very nicely by sir oliver lodge as i mentioned he delivered the becquerel memory lecture organized by the chemical society of london it is available in the journal of chemical society transactions a very nice to read he mentions a discovery of essential novelty cannot be made by following up a train of prediction it is often made during the process of following a clue but the clue does not logically lead to it a really new fact comes aside So it comes as a side issue something unexpected and so it was with the discovery of spontaneous radioactivity becquerel was looking for the possible emission of rontgen rays by a substance in a state of fluorescence if that had been happened it might have been very interesting but it would not have been path breaking but after he critically examined it it turned out to be not rontgen x rays but something else nothing to do with fluorescence and becquerel set himself carefully to examine this kind of penetrating radiation so one can find that it was through his critical analysis it was through his continuous work on all days you uh, know on this exciting topic that he arrived at finally this uh, observation and which he you uh, know 
wrote through several papers. In fact, uh, Henry Becquerel died in 1908, and uh, this talk, uh, this uh, talk given by Oliver Lodge, was titled as "Discovery of Radioactivity and Its Influence on the Course of Physical Science." One can see how the, this discovery made a very big impact on physical science. Dr. Martens is going to talk about, talk to us about subsequent di discoveries. Next slide. In fact, he was not the first person here. Dr. Mr. Vyas mentioned about uh, how quickly one has to publish whatever you find out. This is an example of uh, that topic. Sylvanus Thompson was parallelly doing experiments at uh, Finbury, London, and he did similar things as Becquerel did. He also tested several luminous materials, and he also observed the photographic action occurred only with uranium salts. In fact, he found it just plus minus a few days when Becquerel found out. But what he did not publish it. He sent this observation to George Stokes. We know Stokes for Stokes Law at Cambridge on 29th February 1896. Just one day before Becquerel came to this conclusion, this Stokes received this letter, and Stokes immediately wrote to him, "This is what you observed is very good. Please publish it immediately." But by the time the reply came, and uh, and uh, no, received by Sylvanus Thompson, he tried to write a paper. Uh, he got another letter from Stokes saying that, gentlemen, you are late. Already it has been observed by Becquerel and reported in the academy. Of course, Thompson did not uh, stop there. He published a letter in, uh, letter in uh, July 1896. And you see on the right, it was he titled it as Hyperphosphorescence, where he also mentions Becquerel myself both observed this. So Becquerel was not the only person, but he was so systematic and he was quick enough to understand its impact and immediately announce it to the Academy of Sciences. Next. So we'll just quickly rush through the papers of Becquerel. So one can find there are seven papers of Becquerel in one year, in the year 1896. And that itself shows the extent of study is done. First one starting from 24th February on the rays emitted by phosphorescence. And next on 2nd March on the invisible rays emitted by phosphorescent bodies. And on the paper on 9th March, where he investigated possibility of radiation from hexagonal blend. Next slide. 23rd March, where he highlighted uranium than phosphorescence. This was the paper where he realized that it was uranium and not, uh, not the phosphorescence part. On the 18th, he mentioned that metallic uranium radiates even more intensely than its salts. And he wrote the first example of a metal showing a phenomenon analogous to an invisible phosphorescence. He wrote another paper on November 23rd, and in my next slide, I have summarized his papers in for those researchers who are interested in reading through seven excellent papers, one after another, starting from February till November of that year, all dealing with this. And of course, with this, you can say, you can see how systematic this gentleman was in studying radioactivity. Next slide. Well, after this, next, the very next year, he could publish only two years, two papers, and uh, the complete subject of uh, radioactivity went into oblivion for a few years. These were years of missing excitement. As compared to discovery of X-rays, which caught like wildfire, and uh, no, there was a period in that uh, year, 50 books and pamphlets and 1,000 papers were written just in 1896 on X-rays, because people were so much you know, intrigued by the properties of X-rays, and possibilities of their applications. So not only physicists, chemists, medical people, everyone was studying it. Thousand papers on 1896, and it continued in 1897, 1898, but on radioactivity, hardly a few papers. As compared to discovery of X-rays, this uranic race did not catch excitement. In fact, after this, Becquerel himself shifted to other domains. He started studying Z1 effect. Because he found that, okay, we have done something. He could not follow it up further. He could not understand it. Reason for uh, missing excitement was many because X-rays could be more easily produced. You require high vacuum tube and high voltage. Whereas Uranus, uh, uranium material materials required for carrying out X-rays and work on radioactivity. Effect of X-rays, one could public could see so easily and it is so pronounced. Applications were coming up. So with this, all this, the excitement went down. Until, of course, Marie Curie came into picture next year. Next slide. Now, when Marie Curie entered, she was uh, her first, in fact, we should realize her first journal publication was also related to magnetism of tempered steel. She was not working on radioactivity at that point of time. 
but it is difficult for us to say how history would have been shaped if he had not decided to shift to this uh, particular subject to study the subject of uranium radiation but uh, the papers from becquerel really excited her and she started looking for other materials that could possess properties similar to uranium and from the story of mary curie again the research students can gather several lessons particularly her perseverance her critical thinking and hard work some of these will be evident in the slides that will follow can we see next slide so she was uh, one of the first observations she made was that thorium was as active as uranium in her effect efforts the most important difference what was the difference between her work and henry becquerel's work because she had come into contact with pierre curie at this point of time and pierre curie being a physicist he had a excellent work he had done with regard to electrical discharges etc he had very good sensitive electrometer and using this electrometer she could quantitatively measure the level of radiation emitted by any substance and this made a great difference between the work that was done by becquerel and and curie she she soon very found out that the level of radioactivity associated with different minerals and materials containing uranium it was not always proportional to the uranium content this means that some compounds had something other than uranium as well so she thought definitely that uh, some other compounds some other actinide heavy element should be seen and this led her finally to the discovery that thorium gives out radiation just like uh, uranium of course this is not also uh, this quadrant electrometer which is seen on the right side it was uh, originally developed by lord kelvin but it was improved by pierre curie and that is what came to her uh, help in uh, making these excellent observations next slide so this is a, a sample of uh, substances which she studied and she reported and one can see that uh, here also she acknowledges henry moisson because he gave him gave her the metallic uranium sample and one can see the thorium oxide gives uh, 53 picoamperes as compared to metallic uranium which uh, excited her uh, thinking and one can see that pitch blend which she has put there gave even higher level of uh, uh, you know uh, signal from the electrometer so these are the things which excited her to look for alternate substances can we go to next uh, slide again i should mention mary was not the first to study thorium in fact there was a paper even before mary gerhard schmidt schmidt the german physicist studied thorium even before mary he employed the photography technique and he found that thorium exhibited an activity similar to uranium he also concluded that the emitted uranium from thorium or as little homogeneous as uranium or ranjan rays and in fact he sent uh, his observation to the physical society of berlin in january itself where it was read on february 4th and mary's paper actually appeared only on april 12th of course neither mary nor schmidt studied the radioactivity of thorium later in great detail in it happened to be a very a gold mine and a area of uh, excellent study for rutherford and sodi and which finally brought us to the understanding of radioactivity next slide now since she was studying a large number of materials the materials included wide variety of compounds wide variety variety of elements in the periodic table starting from gallium germanium neodymium praseodymium niobium scandium gadolinium erbium samarium you know all kinds of substances she has studied and she writes i have examined the great number of metals salts oxides and minerals all the compounds of uranium studied are very active the compounds of thorium are very active the oxide of thorium is exceeding metallic uranium in its activity and then she says two ores of uranium pitch blend and chocolate are much more active than uranium itself this fact is very remarkable and lends to the belief that these minerals may contain an element much more active than uranium so you can see the intuition here you can see the critical analysis here and this was a kind of thing which propelled her into further study on the right side you find her original notebook uh, original diary where he has also written the name of poison and also he has written the radioactivity of pitch blend etc next slide so mary's uh, mary curie's paper on radiations from uranium and thorium compounds she presented at the french academy of sciences she was not a member of the academy of sciences this is again very curious thing with curious things which can happen with any research scholar as well it was her paper was presented by gabriel lipman 
Lipman himself was a great uh, scientist. He got his uh, Nobel Prize in 1908. Because Mary was not, not a member of the academy, she was not allowed to present her paper. Only members can present papers. Gabriel Lipman or has, was her, not only her former professor, he allowed Mary to use her laboratory, his laboratory for her thesis work, even though earlier she was working on um, and, uh, mechanism and materials. She, he allowed her to work on radioactivity using her lab for some time. He helped her to find source of support. He was the examiner of her thesis in 1903. So it's difficult to imagine that he would not have read his thesis. But very sadly, he did not support the candidature of Marie Curie for the Nobel Prize when it came to it. On the right side, you find the paper, original, and you can find on the top where it is written by, presented by uh, Lippmann. Next slide. So the work on pitch blend was really the turning point. Her studies revealed that the activity level was two and a half times more than uranium. Finally, she concluded, we believe, therefore, that the substance we have removed from pitch blend, this happened after a very large number of precipitation steps. Again, or Mr. Vyas mentioned it here, it was a great collaboration between a chemist and a physicist. And without this chemical separation, this conclusion would not have been reached. And she could uh, uh, separate a very highly radioactive substance. It was close to bismuth in its analytical properties. And she says that if the existence of this new metal is confirmed, we propose to call it polonium from the name of the country. Can you please see that she has not separated, but she has critically analyzed and concluded that there is another element present here. And this is the first paper which uh, carries the word radioactive. So this radioactive word was not used by Becquerel any time. So one can understand that uh, this uh, phenomenon owes its name to Marie Curie. And you can see, interestingly, at the bottom, the paper which uh, describes this, it was presented to the academy, not by Lippmann, but by Becquerel himself. Becquerel was so much convinced about Mary's work, and she used to collaborate with her, and he presented this paper on behalf of uh, Marie Curie to the Academy of Science. Next slide. So as Mr. Vyas mentioned, Marie Curie, Pierre Curie, and Becquerel got the Nobel Prize in 1903 for physics, one half awarded to Henry Becquerel in recognition of the extraordinary services he had rendered by his discovery of spontaneous radioactivity. The other half jointly to Pierre Curie, Marie Curie. Many people discuss even this, that usually the Nobel Foundation gives one third of, if there are three of people, they will give one third of a prize to each. But it was strange here because for some specific reason, the reason was that Marie Curie was not even considered for this Nobel Prize. Next slide. And... You see the next slide, that's the Nobel Prize uh, diploma. Next slide. Mary Curie actually was not even nominated for the first Nobel Prize. In 1903, four members of the French Academy of Sciences nominated only Henry Becquerel and Pierre. And these nominate, persons who nominated include Lippmann, who was her PhD thesis supervisor and who presented her first paper. Uh, Mascot, Lippmann, Berg Darbo, and Henry Poincare. These people nominated Henry uh, Pierre. Pierre Curie, not Marie Curie, but for the intervention of a member of the nominating committee, Swedish mathematician, Mitta Leftler, she would not have got this uh, probably you know, the prize. Next slide. But uh, so happened that Mitta Leftler was a very uh, eminent and very uh, person with many contacts. He was an advocate of women scientists, even though he was not a science person himself. Uh, he wrote immediately to Pierre Curie, gentlemen, something is happening here in the Nobel Academy here. Your, uh, your name and uh, Becquerel's name are being proposed for the Nobel Prize and not Mary's. The moment Pierre Curie went, came to know that, he made it clear that a Nobel Prize for research in radioactivity that failed to acknowledge Mary Curie's pivotal role would not be correct. And he wrote that if it is true that one is seriously thinking about me for the prize, I very much wish to be considered together with Madame Curie. Well, unfortunately, Nobel Prize can be given only if there is a nomination. There was no nomination for Mary Curie. So what to do? Fortunately, they found that there was a nomination of Marie Curie in 1902 by Bouchard. And incidentally, Bouchard was not neither a chemist nor a physicist. He was a pathologist. He had nominated Marie Curie in 1902. He was a foreign member. And therefore, they felt that the nomination can be carried forward. They used that nomination and gave her the Nobel Prize finally. And interestingly, when it went to the Academy of Sciences, they all understood the import of her work. And they were great prize for her. In fact, they said, one should not, even, even, even though at that point of time already polonium had, be dis had been discovered, radium had been discovered, they said that should not be included in this, probably it should be kept aside. 
so that there is a scope for giving her another another nobel prize and that's how we got she got one more later so in this one she gave, they gave her the prize only for the discovery of radioactivity along with becquerel and the pierre curie next slide now after this of course we see that the new element was discovered but still radioactivity had not been understood so it is not mary curie's work that came to the understanding of radioactivity it was finally rutherford's entry as soon as rutherford entered very soon he was able to show that uh, there were two components with differing powers for ionization of glasses penetration of materials he called them as alpha and beta rays and he word word he uses is alpha and beta rays for convenience you can see on the right side it is just like that he named and they have stuck with us even today just like x rays were named at that time and the name has stuck to us for no reason rutherford joined the cambridge laboratory to work with j j thompson a very uh, you know uh, a famous scientist on ionization of gases and he studied ionization by uranium rays as well and then in this paper only he suggested this lays were like s rays but he did not uh, use the origin of uh, radioactivity in this paper next slide and very soon once again it was a collaboration which cleaned the deal between physicist rutherford and chemist sodi it was a unique collaboration both were youngsters they took up a novel very novel field they intensely collaborated for 18 months from october 1901 and nine journal publications in this 18 months the level of intensity of work we can see i have gone through several of these papers many of them are 20 pages 30 pages 40 pages long very large amount of experimental work in each page really amazing i would rather insist on uh, students connected with radioactivity and radiochemistry to go through some of these papers and the last of the papers titled radioactive change in 1903 you see at the bottom that said the last word and the hypothesis of spontaneous atomic disintegration in the explanation of the phenomena of radioactivity both the exponential decay and many other things were explained in this paper very long paper of course this was still just a beginning many more discoveries followed like the discovery of the nucleus through the gold foil scattering experiment discovery of proton neutron artificial radioactivity and later fission and so on we know that very very long story ahead this would be covered probably some of the next lecture but let me conclude the story of discovery of radioactivity here and of course rutherford won the nobel prize in 1908 for his studies on disintegration of elements and sodi in 1921 for his contributions to our knowledge of the chemistry of radioactive elements so one can see that they had we had contributions from becquerel which took the subject to some level and later on a contribution from curie and later by rutherford and sodi can we go to next slide i will just go through one or two long slides just to tell the students about uh, rutherford i would urge all of you to study not only becquerel and mary curie please read about rutherford very very inspiring kind of scientist very perfect person in fact very first first paper he was uh, tempted to write about uh, transmutation of elements he has found out that what uh, was coming out from thorium was not really uh, thorium itself it was a new element when the, his uh, colleague sodi said rutherford what are you out here observing here is transportation it's so great but he said gentlemen let me not write transportation right now without being 100% sure he was that kind of a person highly ethical and uh, about him his student marsden you know marsden and uh, geiger they were responsible for the discovery of the, the gold foil scattering experiment very great person himself student of rutherford he is, says an investigation was carried out in the old string and sealing wax days with very little expenditure but nevertheless it was easier to make progress in those days nowadays we have two lots of people we have got some experimentalists here and they want machines costing 2 or 3 million pounds or for further probing of the details of the atom's nucleus and we have those rare people those theoreticians who calculate in weird jargon a nomenclature their own the properties of the inner nucleus and they are quite expensive people also because they require costly computers nevertheless it is such men and women who are assembled here from all countries as indeed happened in rutherford's day but rutherford did all his experiments in the method of old string and sealing wax and that is the conclusion we need to see we have today is special because of course yesterday was uh, the sign national science day we were discussing about c v raman in the morning he also mentioned the same thing the success of experiments is not necessarily decided by the amount of money you spent on the experiment on the experiment apparatus but the amount of thinking that you spent on the experiment i want to conclude my talk by going to last slide 
and uh, i want to mention that uh, we should not forget that this year is again a very very important year 125 year discovery of important for environment science it was on this year that svante arrhenius again one of the greatest scientists and uh, he also won the nobel prize a chemist he wrote the first paper on the influence of carbon dioxide in air on the temperature of ground that heating up the greenhouse effect paper was written in the april 1896 in the philosophical magazine and we know how much impact it has created on the history subsequently and mankind subsequently incidentally he also won the nobel prize for chemistry in 1903 i think i have exceeded my time by few minutes i'm sorry but i hope uh, i could take you through a journey of the initial years of the discovery of radioactivity thank you for your attention may we now request uh, dr araceli martens to make her presentation dr martens please i'll go and check that Uh, anurag has to see with the dr martin he is not able to hear us he can he is also not able no, to hear uh, us. Uh, i think there could be some small issue i think that's why professor vasudeva has gone in yeah, just to check up and load the yeah now we are able to see the presentation fine perfect she is not able to hear us she has joined from browser i don't know from which browser so i think it's okay she... so you can speak now dr lopez martens She has to unmute herself. Unmute it. Unmute it. Yes. Doing something. Don't 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 do this. He has to go and go and join again. Leave and join. He has to go and join. So he is so he is joined from Mozilla Firefox. This browser this browser always blocks some of some of the other thing. She's typing something. Maybe switch to following talk. I'll find try to find another computer. Okay, that's all okay. And you also tell her to use. Uh, Uh, good afternoon there, there is some technical issue in connectivity with uh, paris france so dr martens has requested that we can proceed to the next lecture so may we may I request dr venkatesh huh? dr venkatesh
if you please come on line and uh, you make your presentation and we will go back to dr martens after she her problem is resolved dr venugopal unmute unmute ah yeah share yes okay i'll share this time hello it will take a moment wait wait Has it come? Not yet. You, you have to go to Webex page and click share, and then go okay. to application. Uh, I think you, you you can tell him to project it. Then I'll speak on that. Whatever Tomer has done it. Okay, okay. No, you are not uh, given your presentation. No, I have given to him. I already oh, sent it. Okay. okay, okay. Shall I try now? Let us see. No, okay. You try. Tomer is doing. Tomer is at home. He's not here. We are. Somebody is doing. Just hold on for a moment. Yeah, Anurag. Can we Venu, just to share? conserve time with your permission, can we go yes. ahead and uh, request Mr. Sundarajan to speak so that no we look at the Sundar, Mr. Sundarajan, can you come online? Good everyone. Yeah. Mr. Sundarajan. Hello. No? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. We can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. No. Yes, we can. There's some problem here. Problem here. So we can hear you. You can proceed, sir. Okay. Bye. Yeah, I read the presentation. Okay. Okay. Yes, we can okay. see your presentation. Uh, Please proceed. Okay, fine. Can I proceed? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I would like to thank uh, HBNA of the outset for inviting me to talk about the evolution of radiation safety. I will begin my early experience of exposure to ionizing radiation, early regulations. Then I will discuss about the dose response models that are used in the risk assessment. I will briefly mention about the epidemiological studies and research areas in the low level radiation risk evaluation. The dawn of the uh, 20th century, you know what? Discoveries. I think that uh, very succinctly explained that, uh, those two discoveries. The first discovery, as I mentioned, was in 1895, and the second, a year later, the discovery of uh, radioactivity. Now, physicians did not lose much exploring the potential of these two great discoveries, but they were not fully aware of the radiation hazards. As a result, by 1922, 100 radiologists had died of cancer. Cancer among the radiologists was 10 times more than that of the physicians. Interestingly, the very first uh, uh, came from a German engineer, Fuchs, who was in the making of the X-ray uh, vacuum tubes. That was in 1896. He said, keep exposures as short as possible, stand 10 inches away from the X-ray tube, and apply a thick coat of Vaseline on your skin. As there were no instruments to measure the quantity of radiation, 
people use x-rays until they got erythema or the skin burn on their arms. Only it was in 1928, during the second International Congress of Radiology, uh, there was a committee formed called International X-ray and Radiation Protection Committee, which later on became International Commission on Radiological Protection, known as ICRP. Let us look at the uh, safety dose limits in those days. In 1934, it was 0.2 rongen per day, which is about 35 times the current limit. In 1950, it was brought down to 0.3 rongen per week. And in 1956, it was 5 rem per year. This limit remained unchanged for nearly four decades. We'll come back to these limits a little later. The Curie's extracted radium in 1902. It did not take long to recognize the destructive power of the radiations coming from radium. In 1904, Margaret, a New York physician, used this radium for treatment of a cervical cancer. She called the radium for the medical science. That is how the uh, branching therapy started. And very soon, applicators of different shapes and sizes of radium sources were made. And they were all uh, made to suit the radium uh, therapy of uh, you know, treating tumors of different tissues and shapes. But very soon, radium was misused by doctors, quacks, Radium, as you know, had a fascinating glow. People believe it was a miracle medicine that can cure many diseases from acne to insanity. Worse still, it was very widely used in several health products. Let me give some examples of uh, the misuse of radium. Repeated radium injections were given to cure tuberculosis and ankylosing spondylitis. Even in 1970s, 100 spondylitic patients were being injected with radium in each year in Germany. And the uh, 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 device here, it is known as a nasal applicator. And uh, this had a 50 milligram radium at one end, and it would be installed into the nasal cavity of the children, believing it will prevent the future deafness. In USA alone, 2.5 million children were treated with nasal applicators. And look at the kind of cosmetic products which are made, you know, powder, soap, toothpaste, face, uh, face powder, compacts, etc., all containing significant amounts of radium. Radium containing uh, was considered as a supertonic keeping a very expensive radium water jar in the front room was a status symbol. And thus the radium and the human bodies through ingestion, injection, uh, inhalation, and skin absorption used radium very extensively, which had a huge impact on very mystery was radium dial painting industry. Due to war times demand on luminous dials used in aircrafts, uh, ships, submarines, etc., the demand was so high, factories employed a large number of young women to paint the dials. Unfortunately, these young women painted the um, dials uh, while their brushes. In the process, they ingested significant quantities of radium. You can look at a, a section of the workshop here of a radium dial painting industry. Very soon, both of these young women developed serious health issues like inflammation of the bone, anemia, and even bone cancer. Many women did not report their illnesses due to social stigma. 
around 890 women died at a very, very young age. Look at this young woman, how she was. She entered the radiant dial a painting shop and how he looked after a few years. Radium, like calcium, is a bone seeker and uh, it, uh, you know, causes major injury to the uh, bone joints. Tragically, Mary Curie herself succumbed to the radium injury. It is this tragic story of radium dial painters that raised the alarm about the high risk of radium and also about the safety of handling radioactive materials. In fact, the data on the assay of radium in the tissues of dial painters, both alive and dead, help in formulating the standards for internal exposures, uh, you no know, limits for radio neutrons. You all know that the uh, you know, Second World War was brought to an end by the dropping of two atom bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. As a result, two lakh people perished. One lakh people who survived after the uh, war, you know, their health status was uh, followed up. And also, 77,000 children exposed the population were also followed up. Clearly, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki survivors provided huge data on the uh, radiation effects. Other sources of data were radium dial painters, exposures in medical and industrial application of radiation, and of course, a large number of animal experiments. How does radiation affect us? When radiation passes through the body, the resulting ionization can destroy the complex molecules in individual cells, causing mutations. Remember, spontaneous mutations also occur all the time in our body. It is not radiation alone that causes mutations. Chemicals can cause mutation. You must also note that mutations can affect the somatic cells or the germ cells. This can be classified into two effects, somatic effects or genetic effects. Somatic effects occur only in individuals exposed to radiation, whereas the genetic effects are manifested in future generations as well. Some of the somatic effects are immediate effects like erythema or the skin burn, sterility, or reduction in blood counts. On the other hand, cancer and cataract may occur much later after the exposure, which can be chronic in nature or acute in nature. So, some of the biological effects that are radiation exposure at different levels. The unit of radiation used here is sievert. It represents the biological effect caused by deposit of one joule of radiation energy in one kilogram of tissue. One millisievert will be one thousandth of a sievert. All of us are exposed to natural radiation coming from the and thorium around us. That natural exposure is in the order of one to two millisievert per year. For example, CT scan will give you around one to 10 millisievert. Safe limit is 20 millisievert per year. The exposure in the vicinity of an will be less than 0.1 millisievert per year. Identifiable signs of radiation effects will occur around Fatal doses are way high in the region of 5,000 millisieverts. Okay, who prescribes the safe exposure limits? Well, there is an international body of scientists and medical doctors named International Commission on Radiological Protection, shortly known as ICRP. It is a non-governmental body. It reviews periodically the inputs coming from research and operational experience on the countries based their regulations on the ICRP recommendations. In India, the government of India has given the Energy Regulatory Board the mandate 
to protect the workers, public, and the environment from radiation hazards. Let us basic limits for radiation exposure. For the occupation exposure, it is 20 millisievert in a year. For the general public, it is 1 millisievert per year. Please note that these exposures are over and above the natural exposure which we receive. As I mentioned to you, the CT scan will give you around 1 to, to uh, you know, 10 to 20 millisievert in a shot. At such low safe dose limits, you will not see any effect. You see the yellow points here. Okay, these effects are seen at very high dose uh, rates and high dose exposures, which are seen in the case of atomic bombing. Safe do, uh, dose limits have been derived by extrapolating these uh, you know, observations at much lower level. It's a sort of a linear function of the dose. In this, it is assumed there is no threshold below which no effects will occur. This is what is popularly known as linear no threshold hypothesis or LNT model. And by a safe dose, we know radiation exposure can cause cancer, but Radiation is not the only cause. There are many other causes for cancer. Let us see what is the cancer risk from radiation. Let us take, for example, leukemia. The lifetime risk from leukemia due to natural causes, if you take million people, about 4,800 people will have leukemia due to natural causes. Now, supposing if each one of the million people is given 20 millisievert, which is the safe dose limit of radiation, the calculated leukemia cases will be around 40. So you can see that this 40 is well within the statistical limits of that in a natural instance of 4,800. So at such low doses, it is impossible to attribute cancer to the radiation alone. As I mentioned to you earlier, there are many, many other factors which are stronger causes for cancer. Like for example, uh, the uh, kind of food you take, smoking, alcohol. Just 200 additional cancers uh, among 1 lakh to uh, 20,000 cases is extremely difficult to attribute cancer to radiation alone. Effect which receives a lot of attention from the population is the so-called genetic effect. Let us again take, for example, the you know uh, Down syndrome, which is a genetic effect. The natural incidence is around 4,000 in a million population. Now, supposing you expose each of the parents in a million population to the dose of 20 millisievert, then the calculated risk will be around 40. Again, this 40 is well within the statistical variation of 4,000. Let me point out two important facts. One, genetic effects due to radiation have been found only with animal studies, like for example, with fruit flies and mice. There is no evidence whatsoever of hereditary effects found among the children of Hiroshima and Nakasaki survivors. So, yet another risk model that is uh, discussed a great deal nowadays is the so called hormesis model. There are many research studies which indicate that low level of exposures are not only risk free but indeed are beneficial to human health in the sense that they enhance the immune response of the exposed person. So, you can see three models of those response. One is the uh, linear model, which is see here, where the uh, risk is a linear function of the dose with no threshold. Okay, it can be extrapolated to zero here. Then in the exponential, uh, exponential model, you have the threshold dose, the risk increases slowly, 
then later on it uh, increases exponentially. In the hormetic model, you see here, there is no risk. In fact, you have got a beneficial effect up to a certain point, and later on the risk increases as the dose increases. Let me this here. In a EU study, it was found that the incidence of cancer among the, the uh, in, uh, in the various counties, as the radon concentration levels uh, increase, the incidence of cancer is coming down. This radiation hormesis phenomenon may look very odd, but it must be noted that toxic substances like mercury, arsenic, heat, all these display hormetic effects. You know that mercury and arsenic, which are toxic elements, in very, very trace amounts, they are used as drugs in homeopathy. Then, you know, exactly 10 years ago, this month, the Fukushima reactor accidents in Japan dominated the news media for a very long time. About 2 lakh people left their homes, some people directed by the civic authorities, but more people voluntarily. About 1,600 died in this exercise, not because of radiation, but because of disruption and psychological stress, usually due to irrational fear of radiation. Study carried out by UNSCAR on this population found no health effects which can be attributed to radiation. Radiation, of course, does cause uh, DNA damage, but spontaneous, natural uh, DNA damage occurs all the time at a very, very high rate, in fact. In fact, the rate of double strand break is 1,000 times the rate induced by millisievert per year. We must also recognize that very powerful adaptation systems, uh, you know, against any harm to their cells caused by an agent which may be either internal or external. Now, all of us have been living in the midst of radiation all the time. Look at the radiation map of India. Remember, the limit to the public dose is 1 millisievert per year. You can notice that the radiation levels due to natural radiation is in the, you know, is of the same order. In fact, if you move from, you know, uh, Bombay to a play, you know, in a coastal Kerala or coastal Odisha, your radiation exposure may go up by 1 millisievert in a year. In fact, there are many things in the world, like in Brazil, Iran, China, where the radiation levels are five to ten times higher than the global average. Very detailed survey of these populations have been carried out, and they have not shown any adverse health effects. We have seen that the radiation safety standards have been derived based on the uh, linear no threshold relationship between the dose and the risk. What is the risk level when the exposure is repeated for a long period of time and not briefly as it occurred in the case of Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombing? Large number of epidemiological studies about risk at operational exposure level is so low that you require a huge database. Currently, USA is carrying out uh, a project known as 1 million radiation workers study. These results are expected to come out in 2024. Similar epidemiological studies are being carried out by many nations, including India. There are all in progress to understand the myriad aspects of low level radiation. Uh, you have Hormesis, adaptive response, then uh, stimulation of the uh, response mechanisms, triggering of the DNA repair mechanism, and elimination of seemingly damaged cells. These are expected to 
you know, decrease the risk from uh, radiation. On the other hand, you also have some phenomena like supralinear response, uh, high uh, you know, uh, RBE for alpha radiation, then possibility of a population which is more sensitive. There are some phenomena like bystander effect and the possibility of a, a DNA repair, you know, uh, being that wrong fashion. All these will increase the risk on the other hand. So uh, these results from these uh, basic studies, which are going on, will also possibly change the radiation protection standards, but we have to wait a long time for that to happen. Let me put the radiation exposures in a proper perspective. We receive about 2.5 millisievert uh, you know, in a year. This means 87% of this exposure is coming from natural sources like cosmic rays, radon, and the food we eat. Only 13% is due to the natural uh, radiation. Contribution from nuclear energy is just 0.1% or so. Uh, we also point out that uh, people fear radiation because of its potential to cause cancer, but it must be noted that there are much more stronger causes for cancer. Healthy food and smoking together are responsible for two thirds of the cancer ca cases in the world. Let radioactivity and radiation exposures, these are nothing new and they are part of our universe for a very, very long time. And exposures to ionizing radiation is part of our life. The effects of radiation are very well understood. Of course, excess exposure to ionizing radiation is harmful. And it's not Radiation, but through the the atom bombs which are dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Let me end my presentation with many words. Nothing needs to be feared, but everything has to be understood. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Sundararajan, for a very lucid presentation on the uh, evolution of radiation safety. Now we will try to connect to uh, Dr. Martens. I hope yes. we are able to connect her. Can you hear me now? Doc yes, I can hear you now. Thank you. We're okay. really happy to hear. Uh, Mr. Sundarajan, can I request you to put off for a video, even others, if possible, because we are having a real bandwidth problem here. Those who are not speaking, it will be nice if you can put up your video as well. Let's connect to Dr. Arsali Mart Martens okay. now. I'm trying... Uh, this isn't... Mr. Sundarajan, can we request you to st stop your video? Ah, yes, thank you. I know that. I've seen. I've seen Miss Parsa on the net. Hello? Oh? Can uh, you yes. hear me? Yes, we can hear you. 
Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear I you. I cannot we hear you, you now. This is incredible. Um, That's okay. We can hear you. You can proceed with your presentation. Boss, honey, I don't know what happened. Can you help me? It's... Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I, 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 that we can hear I, her. I, uh, okay. Uh, I'm terribly sorry. I, I, uh, I, you can hear me, but I cannot hear you. Um, it's gracious. Um, we can, okay. Um, but how can I share? It asks me to switch to desktop app to share. Uh, but then, then it, uh, just the desktop app. Okay. Try to reconnect. To reconnect. I leave. Well, uh, she's reconnecting. We'll just send a message to everybody. Just hold for a few moments. You can send a message to her. Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, it's, it, uh, it seems I cannot share my PowerPoint, so if you could put it up, then maybe I could uh, yes. just tell yes. you when to change. I'm yes. terribly sorry. No problem. Yes, you can start. Okay. Um, so, again, my apologies for these technical uh, problems. Uh, I, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk in which I'll show you in what context the discovery of radioactivity occurred and how it changed the world of physics and chemistry and science in general. Next slide. So in uh, 125 years ago, in 1896, uh, Henri Becquerel discovers, as you've heard in a previous talk, a spontaneous radiation from uranium. The subject is taken up by Marie and Pierre Curie, uh, who demonstrate that in fact it's a, it's a more widespread phenomenon and they coin the term radioactivity. All three of them uh, will be awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1903. Uh, but before we go on to see how these discoveries occurred, let's take a step back in time uh, and examine in which context these discoveries came about. Next slide, please. 
So at the dawn of the 20th century, uh, many physicists believed that there was not much more to be discovered. Uh, there were Newton's laws of motion and gravitation, Maxwell's uh, electromagnetism, the laws of third thermodynamics and statistical physics. And, and so all these uh, uh, laws could more or less explain uh, what was observed. Uh, as for the constituents of matter, next slide, please. The, the prevailing theory was the one of John Dalton. Uh, he thinks that matter is made of atoms, which comes from the Greek word atomos for uncuttable. He imagines the atom as sort of like a billiard ball, um, and all the atoms of a given element uh, are the same. And what distinguishes the atoms of different elements is their mass. And that's the reason why elements were generally classified according to their mass. Next slide. Uh, and tables were devised to account for the re regularities observed in the chemical behaviors of species. And the most famous table, uh, next animation, uh, is the one of uh, uh, is Mendeleev's table, which you see here, the first version, in which all the known elements at the time are put in the table as a function of their increasing mass. And all the elements uh, in, a, in, a, in a row uh, have similar chemical properties. Now, each element's position in the table is given by the letter Z, uh, next animation, which uh, comes from the, the German Atom Zal. So it's just a number at this point in history. Now, the success of uh, uh, Mendeleev's table is because uh, he questions some masses. You see some masses with question marks. And also, some positions in the table are empty, where uh, Mendeleev thinks that uh, uh, some elements uh, will have to exist with those given properties. Uh, next animation. And in fact, as you see, before 1900, gallium, germanium, and scandium uh, will be discovered. Uh, so it seems that uh, the physics at the time could give a satisfactory explanation to all the observed phenomena. There were, however, a couple of clouds in the, in the blue sky of theoretical physics. And uh, next slide, please. The first cloud was the spectral distribution of thermal radiation from matter. And the problem here, also known as the ultraviolet catastrophe, was that the classical theory uh, expected an infinite number of radiation modes at small wavelengths or high frequencies. Now, this problem was empirically solved by Max Planck, next animation, who could fit the experimental uh, data uh, with a formula. But the problem with the formula is that it implied that radiation could only be emitted and received in packets or bundles, which he called quanta, whose energy was proportional to the frequency. Now, the other cloud, next animation, please, is related to the wave light nature of light this time, which was thought to propagate in a medium called ether. However, nobody could measure the velocity of the Earth with respect to this medium. And the most famous failed experiment is the Michelson-Morley interferometry experiment. And so to reconcile Maxwell's equations with Galilean uh, relativity, Einstein, next animation, formulates his, ther his theory of special relativity, in which he in particular states that the speed of light uh, in vacuum is independent of the motion of the observers. And um, the length contractions and the time dilations inherent to this theory um, um, give a special relationship between mass and energy, which, as you know, uh, has a very special importance in the subatomic world. So theoretically, we're seeing a quantum and a relativistic revolution on its way. Experimentally, next slide, please. The revolution comes from the ancestor of the television, uh, the cathode tube, or more precisely, the Crookes tube. So this is a, 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 an evacuated tube with two metal electrodes. And when high voltage is applied uh, between the electrodes, a so-called cathode ray uh, appears, cathode because it comes from the negative um, uh, electrode. And the rays travel in a straight line. And when they hit the glass wall, they give off a, a, a bright glow. Now, nobody knew what these rays were. Some thought they were waves. Some thought they were particles. And next animation, it's Jean Perrin who demonstrate that, in fact, they're negatively charged by deflecting them with a magnet. Next slide. Things go very quickly when, in Cambridge, uh, Thomson manages to combine an electric and a magnetic field and measures the charge to mass ratio of these particles. And he repeats the measurements with different cathode materials, different residual gases, and he always finds the same result. So he concludes that these particles, which he calls cor corpuscles, uh, must be the constituents of atoms, which are clearly no longer uncut uncuttable. And he imagines that the atom, uh, next animation, as a sea of positive charge 
uh, in which the electrons are embedded. And for obvious reasons, uh, it's called the plum pudding model. Now, the cathode tube is also responsible for two other major discoveries, both of which happened a little bit by chance. Next slide, please. The first one occurred in Willem Rengen's laboratory while he was studying the penetrability of cathode rays. So in order not to be disturbed by the glow of the tube, um, he, uh, he, he put a cardboard over it, uh, but he was surprised to find out that each time he, he applied high voltage to the tube, some paper treated with luminescent salts quite a far way away from the cathode tube would, would fluoresce. And this could not be due to the cathode rays, so he baptized these rays X-rays, X for unknown. He then proceeded to uh, insert various objects to study these, these rays, the penetrability of these rays, and the famous uh, hand of his wife um, went round the world in no time. So this, this news of this incredible discovery spread around the world, and, and very quickly X-rays became used to aid surgery, for example. Now, Rengen, next animation, was the first physicist to be awarded the first Nobel Prize in physics in 1901. And uh, it's, this is the first in a long series uh, as most of the people I'll be talking in this talk will receive Nobel Prizes, either in physics or chemistry or both, uh, which is the case of Marie Curie. So very soon after Rengen publishes his work, Henri Poincaré reports at the Académie des Sciences on this new discovery and tentatively makes a link between the fluorescent glow of the cathode tube and these X-rays. Next slide, please. Now, Henri Becquerel, uh, who is an expert in luminescent, I as we heard, just like his father, this is a family business, decides to investigate uh, this further and by chance chooses to see if uranium salts emit these famous X-rays. What he discovers, again, by chance uh, or by uh, uh, bad weather uh, um, in, in this particular instance, is that uranium salt emits spontaneously some other kind of radiation, which can impress a photographic plate. Becquerel also discovers, next the animation, that uranium rays can ionize air and can discharge a charged electroscope. But this discovery, as was already touched upon in a previous talk, does not attract much attention at first, uh, probably being overshadowed by, the, by Rengen's incredible X-rays. Now, next slide. So this is when a young Polish woman comes uh, into play, Maria Slodowska Curie. She's looking for a PhD, a thesis subject, and decides to study Becquerel's rays. Uh, now, with the help of her husband, she proceeds to quantify precisely the activity of different materials, and she, she manages to do so with an apparatus cap capable of measuring very weak currents. Um, so she has a quantitative measure, not qualitative like Becquerel. And so this, what, what is this device is shown here. The charges are, generating in an, uh, are generated in an ionization chamber. Uh, they make the dial of an electrometer uh, turn, and this rotation is precisely compensated by a charge generator, the piezoelectric quartz, which was discovered by the Curie brothers. So she quickly discovers that thorium is also active, and that the amount of activity, in fact, is proportional to the number of atoms in the sample. So it's an atomic process. Next slide. So then Marie Curie, as was already mentioned, and, and her husband uh, discovered that uh, a particular uranium mineral patch blend is much more uh, uh, active than what can be calculated just on its content of uranium. So they believe something else is responsible for this, and they proceed to try and isolate it. Now, this was a long and tedious procedure which they carried out in this old hangar in the laboratoire uh, at the École de Physique et Chimie Industrielle de Paris. What they had to do, they had to make chemical separations, measure the activities, then uh, uh, perform subsequent separations on the most active fractions and so on. And they had to process tons of ore. In doing so, yes, thank you, uh, Marie Curie identified two new subs uh, uh, substances, the first one in the bismuth fraction, uh, um, and she submits a note uh, to the to compte rendu de l'Académie des Sciences, in which the term radioactive appears for the first time. The second substance, next animation, uh, is found in the barium fraction, and she calls it radium because it's 900 times more active than uranium, and it literally radiates. So Marie Curie defends her PhD in 1903 and is awarded the Nobel Prize that same year with all the problems that we heard about. Um, she will receive a second Nobel Prize in 1911, this time in chemistry, for the discovery for the discovery and the study of these two very special new elements, radium and polonium, which until the 1930s will be the only means that physicists have to go and probe the inner structure of the atom. 
Now, um, next slide. So radium and radioactivity become the new craze, and that's when Ernest Rutherford decides to abandon his work on the conduction properties of gases to study this new phenomenon at the University of McGill in Canada. And he discovers, as was previously mentioned, uh, that there are at least two types of radioactivity, uh, which he calls alpha and beta, with different electrical and penetration properties. In France, um, a third radioactivity, this time neutral, is discovered and logically called uh, gamma. So as now we know, obviously, that alphas are helium ions, betas are, are high energy electrons, and gammas are photons like X-rays. Now, Rutherford, next slide, please, continues his um, work uh, with the brilliant chemist Frederick Soddy. They demonstrate that a radioactive species disintegrates or transmute into another one and establish the first decay series, such as this one, uh, where, which goes from radion, radium to some emanation, so a gas, and then radium A, radium B, radium C, and so on. We now know, next animation, that uh, this is the chain starting from radium-226, turning into radon, so this famous gas, and ending in stable lead-206. Now, next animation. Rutherford also establishes that the rate of decay uh, of one species into another follows an exponential curve and introduces the concept of half-life. So, uh, next uh, slide. So, back, so he, he leaves Canada and is back in, in, uh, in England, in Manchester, where he performs the famous gold foil experiment with his uh, assistant Hans Geiger and a student, Ernest Marsden. So the experiment uh, consisted of a very active source made by Madame Curie, uh, 0.1 Curie, so very active, in a collimator, a thin gold foil, and a little zinc sulfide screen to detect the scattered alpha particles. And what would have to sit in total darkness and count the little flashes that appeared on the screen through a microscope. It was a tedious job. Uh, and no wonder probably that Heinz Geiger then went on to develop something more autom automatic. Anyway, as, as expected, most of the alpha particles just went through the gold foil without hardly being deflected. Next animation. But what was totally baffling is that some alpha particles, in fact, were scattered at large angles. And then there's this famous sentence uh, by Rutherford that was almost as incredible as if you fired a 15-inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. So next slide. So within the plum pudding, plum pudding vision of Thompson, such a result could not be understood. And it took two years of thinking and more experiments for Rutherford to come to the conclusion that all the positive charge uh, had to be concentrated in a very small nucleus. And with this new vision of the atom, next animation, Rutherford can reproduce the experimental scattering data. But then another problem appears. And next animation, Rutherford's atom is unstable because the electrons orbiting around the nucleus should radiate and should find, end up by collapsing onto the nucleus. Uh, this problem, next slide, is empirically solved by a, a, a young Dane, Niels Bohr, who is working in Rutherford's group in Manchester. So he uses Planck's quantization and says, OK, uh, the electrons move around in orbits uh, of fixed size and energy. Uh, and and um, he explains the emission and absorption spectrum, which was known, um, of atoms in terms of electronic jumps from one orbit to another. Now, this model works very well for hydrogen, but fails uh, for atoms more than one electron. Uh, and it can also not explain why some lines are more intense than others. But anyhow, as we shall see, this work marks the beginning of a new field, quantum mechanics. Now, next slide. Experimentally, things are getting very complicated because since the discovery of radioactivity, more than 40 radio elements have been identified um, uh, as you see here in the in the decay uh, uh, of some of thorium and uranium species, uh, so you have v various strange elements: mesothorium uh, one, mesothorium X, thorium X, radium A, and thorium B, and all these various radio elements. The problem is that there are only seven empty spaces in the periodic table between bismuth and uranium. So how do they all fit in? Uh, there's another problem. Next animation. It's a, a chemical inseparability. Some of these new radio elements are chemically inseparable. Next animation. And when there's a chemical inseparability, gender means chemical identity. So Frederick Soddy comes up with the, the, the concept of isotope, uh, meaning in the same place of, of the periodic table. 
according to which radioactive elements uh, can have similar chemical properties, but different masses. Now, this goes totally at odds with the concept that, that the mass is the guiding thread of the table of elements. And so if it's no longer the mass that distinguish chemical elements, what is? And this new problem is solved, next slide, by a, a young collaborator of Rutherford, Henry Mosley. He uses the very new technique of Bragg diffraction and Bragg's law to measure the frequency of the X-ray emission of nearly all the elements in the periodic table. Next animation. And what he observes is a linear correlation between the atomic number Z, so the place in the periodic table, and the square root of the frequency, which means that Z is not just a number, it has a physical meaning. And in fact, they'll soon find, well, make the correlation with Bohr's atom, next animation, that in fact Z is the charge of the nucleus, and then they can understand the periodic periodicities of the periodic table in terms of filling of electronic shells. Now, this result has great impact on the community, maybe larger than Rutherford's discovery of the nucleus. And Mosley would have probably been awarded a Nobel Prize. Uh, however, he died tragically in World War I. So after the Great War, next slide, the world witnessed another great result, the alchemist's dream come true, uh, the first man-made transmutation when Rutherford disintegrates nitrogen by bombarding alpha particles onto it. Since hydrogen is uh, ejected, Rutherford calls this hydrogen the proton, which comes from the Greek first. So it's the constituent of, of the nucleus. And so the vision of the nucleus at the time is that the nucleus is composed of A protons and uh, A minus Z electrons inside the nucleus. Uh, and uh, around the nucleus, there are uh, Z electrons. Now, um, if you look at this, you say, okay, if an electron combined two protons, then surely one electron can bind one hydrogen. And so Rutherford suggests that at some late lecture um, uh, at the Royal Society, that um, he, he suggests the existence of an electron-proton pair, which would have all the characteristics of a neutral particle. Uh, next animation. This suggestion, however, remains unnoticed uh, around the world, except at the Cavendish lab, uh, where Rutherford is appointed director. And we will see the importance of this for the discovery of the neutron. Um, so, next slide. So, in Cambridge, Francis Aston provides the experimental proof of the existence of isotopes by building the first uh, mass spectro spectrograph, which focuses on a photographic plate, um, uh, all the ions with the same charge to mass ratio. And you can see here two examples of, of, of photographs. Uh, when, one when the tube is filled with neon and you see lines at 20 and 22, and one when it's filled with chlorine uh, and you see lines at 35 and 37. And by uh, looking at the different brightness of the lines, he could establish isotopic ratios for the first time. Uh, next animation. He also establishes that all the masses relative to oxygen are whole numbers, with the exception of hydrogen, which is, has a s uh, slightly larger mass than one. And so if you look, in a, in, in a, uh, if you weigh four protons separately, weigh more than four protons uh, in the vision of the time uh, of, uh, of what a helium uh, um, atom would be. So um, he proposes that mass is lost to form nuclei. And in fact, uh, next animation, the astrophysicist uh, Eddington suggests that this transformation of hydrogen into helium is the source of the sun's energy already uh, in, in, at that time. Now, theoretically, scientists around Europe are trying to figure out what Bohr's model of the atom means and why it works. And in the process, physicists such as de Broglie, Pauli, Schrodinger, Heisenberg, and Born are, are laying the foundations of this new field called quantum mechanics. Now, this new mechanics is very quickly applied to the nuclear problem by George Gamow. Next slide. And by solving Schrodinger's equation of an alpha particle confined inside a nucleus, Gamow finds a relationship between the logarithm of the decay rate and the energy uh, of the escaping alpha particle, a relationship which was in fact known experimentally called the geiger newton law. So this new quantum mechanics can explain known phenomena. Uh, quantum mechanics is also a predictive theory, it would seem. And next slide, it all starts with Paul Dirac, uh, who tries to make Schrodinger's equation relativistic. And in doing so, he comes up with an equation, next animation, which has two solutions. The electron, obviously, that he's trying to find, and a second one, which has a negative energy. So Dirac invents what he calls the anti-electron. And in fact, this anti-electron 
is discovered a few years later by Carl Anderson, next animation, who was studying cosmic rays, and he calls it the positron. So this quantum mechanics uh, uh, seems to be able to explain uh, and be predictive. But this is not the end of the discovery of new particles, uh, next animation. It all starts in Berlin, where Both and Becker discover a strange radiation uh, emitted by beryllium um, when bombarded by alpha particles. The radiation is neutral and very penetrating. It, it can go through lead foils. Uh, they don't know what it is, but okay, these experiments are repeated by Irene Curie and Frédéric Joliot in, in France, and they find out that this uh, strange radiation can knock out protons from paraffin. And they think that, that this strange radiation are high-energy photons and are, are sort of doing a Compton effect, but instead of ejecting electrons, they're ejecting protons. And they publish these results. And on seeing uh, the, the work of Irene and Frédéric, uh, Chadwick... Uh, in, uh, in Cambridge knows exactly uh, that this is the famous neutral particle predicted by Rutherford back in 1920. And he goes about to prove it, repeating the experiments with paraffin, but also other materials, but especially measuring precisely the energy of the ejectiles and proving, next animation, that the radiation must have unit mass. Uh, and he calls this the neutron. So if we go to the next slide, so very quickly... This, uh, this neutron is incorporated in, 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 in the nucleus, and models appear uh, of the nucleus composed of Z protons and N neutrons. And so in the space of 34 years, we go, we've gone from the plum pudding vision of the, nucle of the atom to a, a vision that we have today. Uh, next uh, animation. And so, of course, the presence of neutrons in the nucleus provides a natural explanation for isotopes, as people understand now that an atom can have uh, a given charge, Z, which uh, gives given um, chemical properties, but have different masses according to how many neutrons are present in the nucleus. Also, the fact that you don't have electrons in the nucleus uh, solves a whole bunch of other issues, uh, but that's another story. So the 1930s are also a turning point in experimental nuclear physics with the advent of particle accelerators, because until then, the, basically the only things that, we, that, that were available were the energies and the intensities of alpha particles from, from man-made sources. And so people wanted to be able to vary the energies, vary the intensities, and, and this was made possible by, by accelerators. So John Cockcroft and Ernest Walton build an electrostatic machine capable of producing a voltage of about 800 kilovolts. And this was sufficient, according to Gamow's calculations, to, uh, for, for protons to tunnel through the Coulomb barrier of light nuclei. And so what they build is this uh, uh, voltage multiplier made of diodes and capacitors and, next animation, using a 250 kV proton beam, uh, Walton and Cockroft split a lithium atom into two alpha particles and, in fact, give the first experimental uh, proof of E equals mc squared. Because if you do the, 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 um, the conservation of energy, it doesn't work unless you take the masses into account. Uh, so in the, in the 1930s, another discovery is going to come and change the world of nuclear physics. Next slide. And that's the discovery of artificial radioactivity by Irene and Frédéric Joliot. Uh, so th they were bombarding light elements with alpha particles, and they noticed that uh, the, the emission of neutrons and also Dirac's positive electrons. But what they soon discovered is that the emission of neutrons and these positrons was not simultaneous. And when they removed the alpha particles, so the source, the, the, there was still emission of positrons. So in fact, what they had produced, next animation, was a radioactive phosphorus um, or radiophosphorus. Now, this discovery opens up a new field of application for radio elements, which were limited to the very heavy and very toxic metals uh, uh, ab ab above... Um, below uranium, uh, and, and in fact, next uh, animation, uh, already in 1936, the, the, the brother of the inventor of the cyclotron uses uh, phosphorus-32 to treat leukemia for, for the first time. So this, the race is on everywhere in the world to make new radioisotopes. Uh, and next slide, in Rome, Enrico Fermi chooses the easier option uh, of using neutrons instead of alpha particles because they don't carry any electric charge and can interact more readily with the nucleus. He discovers that slow neutrons interact more readily and identify 40 new radioisotopes in three years. Next animation. He even proposes to irradiate uranium uh, to make uh, 
unknown heavier elements in in the process uh, shown here. So uh, uranium would absorb a neutron and then uh, beta decay to element 93. And he even claims to have made elements 93 and 94 and gives fancy names to them, Osonium and Hesperium, which are all poetic names for Italy. So he's awarded the Nobel Prize uh, for these results. Uh, and after receiving his Nobel in 1938, he emigrates to the state to escape Mussolini's uh, fascist regime. So, but Fermi's results spark a worldwide quest for these transuranic elements. Next slide. In Berlin, Otto Hahn, Lise Meitner, and Fritz Strassmann um, repeat Fermi's experiments and identify many new activities and claim to have reached element, the element with 96 protons. Now in Paris, uh, Irene Curie, next animation, uh, identify a substance um, with an activity uh, which behaves chemically very much like lanthanum. And so if we look at the uh, table of, ice, uh, table of um, elements of the time, uh, uh, lanthanum is just below actinium, so they suggest maybe actinium was made by bombarding uh, uranium uh, with neutrons. So the, um, the Berlin group, now without Lies Meitner, who has had to escape Nazi Germany and has fled to Stockholm, try to confirm the French results but they come upon a, a separation problem when they try to extract the radium, thorium, and actinium from the corresponding barium, cerium, and lanthanum chemical fractions. Next animation. And so Otto Hahn, who is a very brilliant chemist, comes reluctantly to the conclusion, and he publishes this, that instead of radium, thorium, and actinium, they had in fact produced uh, barium, lanthanum, and cerium. Uh, and, but how could this be? Because this, this was unheard of in all in the history of nuclear transmutation. Only radioisotopes very close to the initial material had ever been produced. So he doesn't know what's going on. But Lise Meitner, who is still in contact with Otto Hahn, next slide, finds the solution to the problem with her nephew Otto Frisch, who has come to visit her in Stockholm from Copenhagen, where he's working with Niels Bohr. So they actually visualize how the absorption of a neutron could lead to an instability, deformation, which would grow under the effect of the Coulomb repulsion between the protons and ultimately lead to the nucleus splitting into two fragments. Next animation. So the activities that Fermi, Hahn, and others had identified did not correspond to transuranic elements, but to much lighter fission uh, products. And so they uh, immediately realized, next animation, that due to the difference in masses, that the quantity of energy released in such a project would be huge. And so Fritsch, next animation, returns to Copenhagen and he immediately performs the experiment and looks for a huge ionization signal, which he finds. And this is also checked in Paris by Julio. And very quickly, all this is happening in, 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 few, in the space of few months, next animation, Niels Bohr, together with uh, the American John Wheeler, will quickly develop a theory of fission based on the nuclear liquid drop model. Of course, as you all know, the energy released in the fission process will be put to military use during the war with the Manhattan Project. As for the long sought transuranic elements, uh, they will finally be discovered in Berkeley. The Neptunium will be discovered in 1940 and then plutonium in 1941. Next slide. So during the war, uh, another type of radioactivity is discovered in the Soviet Union by Flerov and Petrak. Uh, spontaneous fission, which brings to five the number of so-called classical radioactivities. You have beta minus and beta plus on either side of the so-called valley of stability in this chart of nucleides. Alpha emission for heavy nuclei in yellow, uh, fission for the heaviest nuclei, and gamma emission for all nuclei. Now, what also is appearing in this chart of nuclei are some numbers, 2, 8, 20, 28, and so on, which are called magic numbers. Next slide. So these numbers are called magic uh, because nuclei with that number of protons and or neutrons uh, are more abundant than others. They are also more bound than others, very much like what is observed for the rare gases in atomic physics. And next animation. So a young uh, physicist working in Chicago with Teller by the name of Maria Gopert Meyer, she, she notices this and suggests the periodic structure of the nucleus, just like a period structure, electronic um, structure for the atom. And she publishes under the title On Closed Shells in Nuclei. And this article does not contain any theory, and for a good reason, is she's tried to, to reproduce with quantum mechanics these numbers, but she has not managed to. Uh, next slide. 
And it's Fermi who, uh, who um, solves the problem by one evening and in Chicago asking her the following question, is there any indication of spin orbit? In other words, is there a preferred orientation of the spin of the nucleon with respect to its orbital motion? And the answer is yes. And Mar Maria uh, sees this immediately and she solves the problem in the night. And by adding a spin orbit coupling to a standard potential, she manages, next animation, to produce a shell structure of the nucleus um, whose filled shells reproduce the magic numbers. And she publishes, next animation, um, this result, not forgetting to thank Enrico Fermi at the end of the article. Now, at the same time, on the other side of the ocean, the German Hans Jensen comes independently to the uh, same conclusion, and both of them will be awarded the Nobel Prize and will collaborate uh, together on writing the first book on the shell structure of the nucleus. Now, this model is very successful in many aspects, but it fails to reproduce some data, next slide, on nuclear moments, which are starting to gather, thanks to the uh, accelerators and, and from electron scattering experiments in particular. So here you have electric uh, quadrupole moments reported, and most of the moments are in line with the shell model predictions, which are the pink lines I've drawn in. But some data are 30 times larger, indicating that nuclei have very large electric quadrupole moments. How could this be? And in fact, it's uh, uh, during a conference uh, by Charles Towns, who, who is the author of this data at Columbia University, that the American, uh, James, the American physicist James uh, Rainwater has sort of like a, a, an epiphany, a revelation. Next slide. What if valence particles could polarize the nucleus into deforming itself? So he then proceeds to calculate the polarizing effect that some extended uh, valence particle trajectories would have on the rest of the nucleus, and he proves that in some nuclei can indeed gain in binding energy by deforming themselves. And uh, at the same time, um, sitting in his office is Owe Bohr, uh, the son of Niels Bohr, and so he comes back to Copenhagen, next slide, and embarks with uh, Ben Mottelson uh, on the theoretical formalism of coupling between collective modes of the dis this deformed nucleus, vibrations and rotations, to the motion of individual nucleons inside the nucleus. And this leads to the so-called unified model. And one of the most spectacular uh, next animation results was the demonstration that a sequence of nuclear levels that you hear here, here in hafnium, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, could be understood in terms of rotation. And you see that the energies uh, of these levels measured by, uh, um, by measuring the absorption of internal conversion electrons and the predictions by this unified model in parentheses. So it's very uh, good uh, uh, predictions. Anyway, so Rainwater, Bohr and Mottelson receive in fact the last Nobel Prize in nuclear physics in 1975. But their work marks the beginning of modern nuclear theory uh, and next animation, and also the beginning of the golden age of nuclear spectroscopy. Uh, next animation, uh, which benefits from the development of more and more powerful detectors to probe the states of the nucleus, uh, whose electromagnetic emission you see here clearly with a scintillator detector at the top of the figure, uh, but it's strikingly, uh, more strikingly with the use of semiconductor-based detectors. So you start to really look at um, uh, uh, very rare states um, uh, and have a, a better insight in, 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 into the nuclear structure. Uh, the other development, other animation, is of course uh, the development of ion sources and heavy ion accelerators. It became possible to accelerate uh, increasingly heavier ions and to much higher energies, making it possible to create new nuclei and nuclear reactions and to reach new nuclear states at high excitation energy, for example, or, or at greater angular momentum. Next slide. So this has made it possible uh, to evidence very exotic nuclear states, such, for example, superdeformed states. This is the, the emission from a superdeformed dysprosium-152, for example, so which corresponds to extreme nuclear deformations. Next animation. And also the phenomenon of shape coexistence, where different nuclear shapes compete within a small range of excitation energy. Next animation. So nuclear physicists have also been able to complete the seventh period of the periodic table, synthesizing new elements using fusion reactions. And you see here in red the latest ones, nihonium, moscovium, tennessine, and organisson, which is the heaviest man-made element, which was made by fusing calcium ions 
with californium atoms and, and, and observed to decay uh, by nuclear spectroscopy techniques. We, uh, uh, in particular, it's alpha, characteristic alpha emission to the nucleus with 116 protons livermorium. Uh, so next animation. So as nuclear physicists have pushed the discovery and precision frontier further and further, new phenomena have been observed, such as the disappearance of the standard magic numbers and the appearance of new ones uh, when one goes to uh, exotic nuclei with many more neutrons, for example, the existence of um, neutron or proton halos. So lithium-11 has the size of lead-208, for example. Uh, and new types of radioactivities have been discovered. Here you see the picture of a two-proton radioactivity in iron-45, uh, unusual fission modes, and even pear-shaped nuclei, such as this radon-222. So uh, to conclude, I would say, next slide, uh, uh, that I've sh as I've shown you, um, major discoveries have been intimately connected to new measuring devices and technical and theoretical advances. So I think it's safe to say that 125 years after the discovery of radioactivity and the discovery of now more than 3,300 3, 3, nuclei, nuclear physics has many more surprises in store for us with the coming online of new stable and radioactive beam accelerators and the next generation detectors and spectrometers. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Martens, for a very fascinating account of the development of nuclear physics and discoveries in the last 125 years. You compressed all of that into a presentation of about half an hour. And thank you very much for uh, your presentation and for the technical glitches which uh, presenting it as much as we And we the so we thank you for the presentation of the program, but after we will focus on the development of the history of chemistry in India. Dr. Martin will be the presentation so that you can go and make a speech. Dr. Martin, please. The slides. Are the slides seen? Hello. Hello. Can you see the presentation? No, sir. No, we cannot see. Okay. Okay. So I share. Share screen one, right? Dr. Vedu Kupal? Yeah, yeah, we can see, sir. Yeah. Vedu Kupal ji. Yes. Good evening to all of you. Are you able to listen, please? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah. Good evening to all of you. I am extremely thankful to EMCAS for organizing this 125 years of discovery of radioactivity. I am thankful to Tomer, who is the president of EMCAS, and to Dr. Vasudeva, vice chancellor of HBNI, for organizing this program. I still remember 1996 when Ron Beck to celebrate 100 years of discovery of radioactivity as well as X-ray. The initial two lectures, one is from, uh, I think from France, next was SK Patil. And today I really recognize what Vasudevara has presented. I remember Dr. Uh, SK Patil. 
which he used to present with the kind of a slide projector. And I think probably I might have listened about 15 to 20 lectures. So I will be talking about the evolution of radio chemistry research program in India. I have given a talk when compared to 50 years of radio chemistry, I think in 2007. And there were several articles, um, I think one in uh, EMCAS in 2001. And I think uh, later on, uh, I think um, Dr. B.K. Manchanda has done the radio chemistry research program in India. I think in 2012, he has published in Radio Chemical Act. Next, please. Next projection, yeah. So I'll just um, talk about early history. Uh, in 1950s, in many of the universities in India, they might be um, teaching about nuclear physics, radioactivity research, etc. But I don't know whether any research program was being done in many of the universities at that time, because I don't know that. Because uh, I have been taught by uh, physical chemistry by Samuel Glaston's uh, book. So I remember many of those things which have been taught is uh, <clears throat> decay statistic, radioactivity, decay, uh, the law and geiger natal rule, etc., etc., etc. Then, uh, after the formation of the Department of Atomic Energy, the AEET, Atomic Energy Establishment Trombre, which later became DARC, was formed. And I remember 1954, uh, the radio chemistry lab design was initiated with the help of UKE Harwell. And uh, 1956, Apsara 1 megawatt reactor was inaugurated. I think that was the beginning of Radio, uh, radio chemistry in India, to, to my understanding. I still remember early to that, I think iodine 131, phosphorus 32 were also getting imported and that being, being used also, which I heard uh, through uh, VK Aya, who I interviewed him for the Saga of Atomic Energy program in, I think, some 10 years before. And some of the universities are starting using tracers for the research in the early period. Next, please. So actually, there was nothing like a radio chemistry program at uh, DAE. See, I will be touching upon mainly with respect to DAE programs and touch upon some of the other units in DAE where radio chemistry is done. Wherever radio isotopes are used, radio chemistry is being done throughout the DAE. And many of the universities, which was really flourishing in 1960s and 70s, I don't know about the present status of what is uh, being done there. Whatever I have done it up to 19, uh, 2012, whatever has been presented by VK Manchanda latest publication. So AEC formation, mainly chemistry department, Dr. Jagdish Shankar was the chemistry head and physical chemistry section, analytical chemistry section. Under that, radio chemistry section headed by Dr. H.D. Sharma, who was the student of uh, Glenn Seaborg. He joined and probably radio chemistry started at that time. Then there were other sections. Pure, uh, I, I have taken this information from K.S. Vengade Swarlu's uh, presentation, I think probably after completion of 50 years of chemistry division. Then ore dressing section, ore extraction section, etc. But radio chemistry 1958, then isotope division simultaneously. And they have all bifurcated by various types of other radio pharmaceutical division, a lot of radio chemistry being done there. Isotope application division, board of radiation for isotope technology, the supply of isotopes after the development of diagnosing therapeutic radio pharmaceutical by radio pharmaceutical division. And many of the solid state uh, fuel fabrication facilities in radio metallurgy division, uh, advanced fuel fabrication facilities, and a lot of radio chemistry is done in reprocessing group and waste management group. And a uh, lot of um, quality control aspects and uh, determination of nuclear materials was done by Numax cell in 1976. Later on, again, radio chemistry got bifurcated in 1985 by radio chemistry division and field chemistry division, which got further done by product development division, RACD, radio analytical chemistry division. I don't know the present status. It may be further divided. I don't know whether it is the same. In the case of IGCR, chemistry group and uh, reactor, uh, I mean, uh, processing group, uh, radioactive process, I mean, uh, processing group, they have done large amount of radio chemistry work. Next, please. In 1956, actually saw the beginning at South Side, because I told you before 1954, it was initiated to set up a class A laboratories. 
and uh, many of the information which I have got it in 1957 publication in the Peaceful Uses of Atomic Energy Conference. I think Homi Jahangir Baba attended the conference and this particular <clears throat> details of uh, the laboratory at Southside S60 was really given. It's a very small prototype laboratory, even today it is functioning. And uh, this is becoming a training ground for a training of chemists, metallurgists, and they have been told how to handle radioactivity, both alpha and beta. I still remember some few grams of plutonium was obtained from Harwell, and that has uh, stood in uh, many of the uh, um, training of many of the scientists, both engineers. And once 1957, 90, training school started, scientists got recruited for all the divisions to handle uh, radiations, both in the chemistry, physics, as well as metallurgy. And uh, this particular experience in setting up the laboratory in 1956, 57, uh, made a, uh, I mean, a lot of facilities have been uh, have to be modified and uh, for handling higher activity. So uh, uh, radiological laboratory facility in 1966, it was done. I think the design was made and set up by LNT, designed by, I mean, uh, by American firm and set up by LNT, completed in 1969. And I remember I was uh, shifted to 1970, but I was asked to join in S60 laboratory to accommodate um, uh, in this particular new laboratory, radio chemistry division, fuel chemistry division, radio metallurgy division, and isotope division. Next. The torch bearers, I think that is what is the most important thing. Dr. Ichel, initial program was organized mainly by the people from abroad, Dr. G. A. Wells, Imperial College London, uh, G. R. Hall, UKAEA. And H.D. Sharma, I said about the student of CBAR who became the head of the radio chemistry division. Dr. Taylor, who was instrumental in isotope division setting up. Dr. Ramanaya, uh, he was an associate of Wall and Sugarman, who were uh, busy with the uh, discoveries in the United States. Dr. V.K. Aya, who came from France because of uh, Homi Baba, brought him back. And this he has told me when I was interviewing him. And a large number of students, I said 1957 by training school joined. Some of them I'll be touching upon because it's very difficult to name large number of people. P.R. Rai became very important person as a metallurgy program is concerned. P.R. Nadrajan for chemistry program is concerned. Dr. C.K. Matthews was instrumental for uh, setting up the laboratories at Kalpakam. And Dr. D.D. Sooth became uh, important with respect to fuel chemistry. Division. Next, please. This is the laboratory, even today it is there, a lot of facilities have changed. One is an active alpha laboratory, another is beta laboratories. Large amount of uh, investigations have been done, even today it is uh, in uh, operation. Next. This is the, even today, this is the kind of a view, this is still there. Many of the facility internally has been changed to accommodate the present status requirement for radiological lab. Next. This is the kind of a laboratory which is uh, in the alpha laboratory where you can see the glow box and uh, be for uh, doing some of the beta activities as well as alpha inside the few modes. You can see the few modes. Next. These are the uh, view of the glow box handling in that time. Next. Uh, this is uh, in 1970s. So those, whatever the pictures I have shown, that is one 1960s. This is 1970s. Uh, the la uh, latest pictures, I don't have it. You can see some of the people who may be knowing it, who were probably retired in 19, 2010 or 2011, they will be able to remember many of these people. Next, please. Uh, this is the present radiological facilities. Even this is modified, which I have an old picture. Next, please. Okay. Okay. This is the layout as a modern uh, radiological facilities. Next. Uh, this is the kind of a laboratories uh, present uh, the view you can see. Next. Okay. What are the new radiochemical facilities which have come up? One is in, I said, Kalpakam, Tarapur, rep several reprocessing plants where radiochemistry work is done. They give us complete support for radiochemistry with respect to reprocessing. And uh, radiochemistry plant is coming up, uh, Vaisa, Visakhapatnam. Radiochemistry support to NFC, radiochemistry support for water and steam chemistry. These are the areas where Lots of radiochemistry is being done. Next, please. Okay, I'll touch upon briefly some of those things. When I joined, mainly, see, there will not be like um, compartment. 
not radio chemistry what is done isotope division what is done uh, uh, radio uh, metallurgy division what is done i'm just putting everything together so it will be kind of a mix up so for example measurement of fission products i remember neutron induced fission product of several nucleates you name them each one of them produce uh, kind of a phd the mass yield curve and the separation signs i remember many of us who have passed in 1970s uh, msc the qualitative analysis of separation both for cation and anion i remember uh, similar to that uh, you irradiate the um, uranium you get that fission products and then try to separate them you understand full chemistry of the separation as well as understanding of the chemistry of the element and then later on development of perturbed angular correlation positron annihilation spectroscopy and several nuclear analytical uh, techniques particularly neutron activation analysis a lot of improvements a0 method so many things have been done prompt gamma analysis and international intercomparison experiments have been done pgnna another technique solid state nuclear tract detectors which was used for exploration of uranium uh, half life determination of several of the actinides mass and analytical spectroscopy and later on uh, some of the radio chemistry work has been done vecc using for accelerators as well as radio chemistry in ta for accelerators one of the important discoveries it is very difficult for me to do everything plutonium 236 was a very important one it is used as a tracer for many of the applications next please uh at that time there is nothing like uh, fuel chemistry and everything large amount of uh, thermodynamics solid state business has been done post irradiation examination non destructive analysis <clears throat> which is required for measurement of uh, uh, anti material like plutonium destructive analysis for qualitative analysis analysis of plutonium polonium and tritium radio isotope production application for diagnostic and therapeutics for health for which large amount of radio chemistry has to be done which has been used for societal applications for many of the isotope for agriculture and industries in the case of radio metallurgy metallic fuel development uranium uranium various alloys oxides carbides and nitrides as a fuel for various types of reactor requirements and specification development for various quality control aspects and fast reactor fuel development which was a very very important one with respect to prototype fast builder reactor as well as fbtr fast builder test reactor at kalpakam and full fuel cycle chemistry was done in various divisions inside dae and uh, later on uh, in the case of um, uh, sodium technology for fast reactors determination of hydrogen oxygen carbon monitors how to be developed in situ in indian context and especially the hydrogen monitor which has been developed by kalpakam is being tested also elsewhere and it is being used next please active line recovery was the one of the major uh, developments which has been taking place both in uh, brc and as well as kalpakam as well as in reprocessing group and as well as um, uh, fuel chemistry division is concerned non aqueous chemistry was originally thought about it in the sense of chloride volatility for thorium uh, based fuels neptunium chemistry large amount of work has been done and a complete review has been done on uh, neptunium chemistry covalent chemistry both solids as well as uh, for various other uh, transition i mean uh, trans plutonium elements have been done uh, protactinum chemistry large amount of work has been done in addition to pokaron 1 and 2 the mass yield to confer the fission and fusion signatures have been carried out by these divisions next please and once of plutonium means i think plutonium is required for various other program and quality control in uh, for various strategic program as well as alloy development program for reactors is very important one various type of facilities have been done to do fluorination in situ inside the glow boxes carbothermic reduction is required for various other uh, fabrication of fbt or fuel and then not only that in the case of actinides you have to, you have to recover if it is uranium 235 uranium 233 or plutonium 239 you have to recover them from whatever the waste material which is generated after the quality control so you have to do waste management within the limits which are required polonium 210 is a very important chemistry because it is one of the very i don't know how those days people are handled madam fury because plutonium 210 is such a very tough thing it comes through all the glasses and your hand is contaminated whenever you do the experiment with respect to polonium 
So both solid state chemistry as well as aqueous chemistry of hydrogen uh, 210 has been done. Tritium is another very important strategic material. It has been uh, prepared and developed, and uh, it has been determined uh, both uh, um, radiochemically uh, as well as by uh, this one cal cal calorie meters. Next, please. Uh, I think um, in the beginning, uh, MSBR is uh, very, very important. When I joined, that was one of the things. United States Open National Laboratory was working on this particular concept for effectively using the thorium. Uh, very, very important one, but uh, they have asked India to find out whether plutonium can be used for startup uh, MSBR, for which we have done quite a lot of work. And also in these same uh, facilities, we have done chlorination volatility for thorium based fuel because thorium chloride is a highly volatile material. So that one can very easily separate from uh, uranium. Next, please. Other mixed oxide program, uh, whatever has been done uh, in the case of solid state uh, uh, chemistry, phase analysis by using X-ray, XRF, and so many things have been done. Chemical characterization by using various types of analytical techniques. I will not go into details. Analytical spectroscopy, many of these mass spectrometry as well as these things, international, international comparison experiments, they have participated. They have developed CRM material, both uranium oxide, thorium oxide has been developed as a CRM because of the import restrictions. Next, please. Mixed carbide program is one of the very important one. I think if you go through the uh, early history of why carbide program for MBTR was chosen, it's a huge uh, uh, program because of non-availability uh, of uranium-235. I will not go into that, for which so much uh, work has to be done. And originally, this uh, mixed carbide MBTR, 70% uh, plutonium carbide, was uh, only 25,000 megawatt days per ton it was supposed to be. But today it has operated uh, experience, I think more than 60,000 megawatt days per ton. And uh, phase analysis has been done originally and several chemistry has been done, both to starting material as well as in the post irradiation examination, Kalpakam in hot cells. Next. I think uh, I will not go into details of this. So many things have to be done in order to say that FBTR fuel will be function very nicely to see the burn up of 25,000 megawatt days per ton burn up. Next. I think salt gel is another one of the contribution which they have done it for uh, development of uh, microsphere based, both for um, soft microspheres or also hot microspheres. Uh, I think they have irradiated some of these, uh, both sol um, uh, solid microspheres as well as uh, the SGMP route. I think that was done in Kalpakam in a thermal reactor. Next, please. I think this is the typical picture. I think now they are diversified to develop various types of other oxide material using the salt gel material. Next. Radio isotope program. I, I told you very clearly, uh, originally when the 1960 laboratory and RLG was set up, one was radio chemistry division, radio isotope division, another one is radio macology division. Three divisions. I think uh, when I remember that uh, totally about 350 people to be accommodated, I, today it may be much more than that because a lot of exp expansion has taken place. They have, uh, in the case of radio isotope program, their main aim is to production and supply of radio isotope for board of radiation for both diagnostic and therapeutic for distribution to various nuclear medical centers. Board of radiation for isotope technology is a research as well as sales of isotopes. As I remember, it is more than a radio, 80 radio isotopes are produced and extensive research on radio isotope for both fission as well as particle accelerators are being carried out in radio pharmaceutical division. And the applications for various industries as well as uh, in the case of water management, etc., isotope applications have been done. And uh, um, they supply various other isotope, cobalt 60 for uh, teletherapy unit, uh, iridium 192 for the gamma cameras and various other isotopes, iodine 131, molybdenum 99, phosphorus 32, samarium 153, lutetium 177, so many things they are continuously producing, quality control it, and supplying to various types of nuclear medicine centers through BRIC. Next. I, uh, I think um, iodine 125 is a very important one. Very recently, uh, ruthenium 106, I have been seeing it. Lutetium, uh, lutetium 177, I think it is being used for therapeutic application now. 
when i was there i think they are using it mainly for diagnostic the fusion product separation of radio pharmaceuticals i think molybdenum technetium recovery i think that facility is being set it up otherwise we were getting it uh, molybdenum technetium generators uh, fluorine 18 and medical cyclotron facilities and various other isotopes using cyclotron are being produced iodine 131 capsules which is very important they have done it cesium 137 glass pencil which is been used uh, because it is having a half life of 30 years it can be used for irradiation purposes fission molly being set up otherwise we have been getting large amount of fission molly from imported material and uh, several medical centers it is being there next in igcr i told you very clearly uh, the stalwarts who have joined after 1957 they became the torch bearers for various types of program in the dae in the case of indira gandhi center for atomic research dr ck matthews who is from the second batch of brc training school their main focus is on fast reactor fuel cycle even though i have touched some of these things in the earlier projections the main important contribution to my knowledge is the boron development hub boron 10 for industrial scale applications and metallic fuel development uranium plutonium oxide microspheres and it's being irradiated they have done post irradiation examination of btr fuel for very high burn up fuel in the hot cells at kalpakam they have developed methods for pyrochemical processing of metallic fuel development in the years to come they are planning sodium chemistry and online monitors is one of the excellent job they have done it and quality control of impurities in sodium fuel clad cool and interaction studies both at kalpakam as well as brc have been done there will be always kind of a Uh, very good competition between them they will be interacting and publication of fuel clad coolant chemical interaction mainly a kind of a thermodynamics materials third phase formation that is one of the jobs they have done it excellently and they have developed solvent without any dilute for fbr processing next please now i'll touch upon very briefly because whatever i have uh, interacted Many of the interactions which has been because of the nuclear uh, chemistry, I mean, Nuclear Symposium, Sestak Symposium, that is Separation uh, Scientist Symposium, Indian Thermal Analysis Society Symposium, Indian Nuclear Society Symposium, then RCEPs, which has been organized by uh, from VCC Calcutta, I mean, uh, Center, and Nuclear Analytical Chemistry Symposium. and several ncas workshop that is the way we have been interacting with the dae other universities and brc training school uh, that is a kind of a um, uh, input to various types of program and initially the program was only done brc training school now it has been spread to various places i think today ma in the afternoon it was uh, uh, hbni has presented what are the various facilities which are available in various centers and the homi baba national not uh, university homi baba national center institute has come to collaborate with the respect to uh, institutes and uh, peaceful use of atomic energy conference especially 2009 we have a large number to it has to commemorate the 100 years i mean uh, birthday 100 birthday of our homi baba jahangir baba the uh, originator of all the programs in dae and many of this uh, information i have taken from saga of atomic energy in india ian cast publication and books published on indian atomic energy program next uh, i remember active groups in 1960s because that is what bhu was doing um, in the, then andhra university pune utkal nagpur institute of science bombay also iit roorkee sinp gp pant university i don't know whether any further things have been added after 2012 some of the professors whom i interacted bm sukla professor aj arnikar who has written books on that and uh, mn shastri has written books on uh, radio chemistry sr mohanty bc haldar professor thorail ak day sn batacharya an garg rajurkar um, i remember uh, lahiri 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 is still in service i think rajurkar might have retired she was uh, taking care of the pune institute of the arnikar then several books are written on uh, radio chemistry actinite separation science etc by many of these scientists next please 
in academic institution pune uh, from the publications i understand uh, they have worked mainly on diffusion of ions and uh, instrumentation neutron activation analysis and they have a source of californium 252 i think one of the high strength sources they have got almost all sorts of detectors including hpt instead of science was working on that uh, but uh, madam and kurav was there californium 252 instrumental neutron activation analysis radio analytical chemistry i think some of our students uh, may be still involved i don't know whether they are having a research program now bardwan was one of the very good uh, teaching and then application in radio tra traces gb pant they have a tracer lab nuclear analytical chemistry soil analysis they have been doing it nagpur i remember when professor garg was there quite a lot of work was done teaching tracer applications separation science and they have several counters they have i think um, i remember they have um, participated in many of the international internal comparison on neutron activation analysis utkal i remember those days it was very very active hot atom chemistry coordination chemistry complex chemistry of actinides i don't know the present status of that snp is still active production of tracer isotopes uh, by reactors as well as particle accelerator separation science biological sciences and environmental sciences i think uh, La professor lahiri is working very nicely and i think he is every year he is conducting various types of program for uh, making large number of people to participate in his conferences next i think um, some of the photographs which i have got it when i was in uh, working in the brc i had almost all programs i mean photographs i could only have some few numbers with me now uh, which i um, went through this is dr ramanaya Uh, who has started the radio chemistry program i think this is a uh, professor rob with the chemistry group i think this is um, uh, vk iya um, the father of isotope program next please hc jainans at the back i think this is um, uh, ck matthews this is ts murthy this is rob i think this is ts murthy and some of uh, our colleagues who have retired probably in 2010 or something like that they can recognize many of them next please i think this is uh, baldev raj who was the director of brc who has initiated a large number of programs there cv sundaram was one of the directors and igcs center i think um, did he did he sooth and that myself i think this photograph i was having it i think that is sb manohar at the back who has uh, trained me in uh, some of the experiments when i joined uh, radio chemistry division next please i think uh, this is um, uh, i uh, I, uh, i think chidambaram is there i think pk ayangar dr ramanaya at the back dr rao is at the back i think this is uh, mysore uh, i think uh, ramurthy may be knowing him i i, I forgetting uh, his name sorry next please i think i think that ah uh, this is only one photograph i could get it uh, p r rai at the end last uh, he is sitting there and then uh, iyer is uh, um, sitting here i think this is uh, av jadhav and that is pk ayangar i think this is one of the radio chemistry program they came for initial i mean starting this i think when he was the director iyer was the director of that thank you please these are the references from where, where i could get it now one is the dai website if you see that you have a, a saga of atomic energy program in india uh, that is available i think three volumes and one of the volumes is devoted to complete chemistry atomic energy india 50 years completed by cv sundaram lv krishnan ds ayangar some of the ion con publication 2001 we have put a radio chemistry program in india and i have given a lecture myself in nucor 2007 unfortunately i don't have many of the uh, slides and then radio chemistry india a saga of five decades by bk manchanda that is one of the latest one it was published in radio chemistry acta volume in 2012 i think i am thankful to you i hope i am within the time thank you very much uh, thanks uh, dr venugopal uh, sir uh, for your nice uh, presentation of the various activities uh, Uh, as well at that time uh, radio chemistry section in uh, chemistry division and finally radio chemistry uh, divisions and then many other uh, activities 
Uh, and now radio chemistry has really taken a big shape and helped uh, the activities in many ways. Uh, I thankful to you for nicely presenting the uh, uh, history of the radio chemistry in India at uh, BRC, IGCAR, Pune and other uh, uh, universities in India and also brought about the various activities carried out by the uh, radio chemistry division and other uh, divisions uh, in B at BRC and uh, IGCAR and other places. Um, uh, uh, thank you, uh, sir. Uh, now it is my uh, uh, privileged duty to thank all the participants and also conclude the concluding remarks. Uh, first of all, I will thank all the uh, speakers for nicely presenting the uh, various topics. Uh, um, uh, on the special webinar on to commemorate 125 years of the discovery of radioactivity. Uh, uh, you, all of you might uh, agree with me that um, uh, in last two hours we have the president address by uh, C. K. N. Vyas and subsequently invited talks by four eminent uh, scientists um, who have covered the various aspects of radioactive right from this uh, uh, discovery uh, uh, on first March. 1896, uh, this day, and progress from that event to the application in various domains, uh, from nuclear power to agriculture, uh, food preservation, and other things. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, C. K. N. Varis, in his uh, uh, president remark, uh, talked about this: how the research uh, in radio chemistry and that progress has uh, taught us uh, scientists this curiosity, preservance. Uh, ethical standards and collaborations that help in developing this field uh, in various ways. And uh, finally, uh, what m most matters for the research is the curiosity driven research, and that uh, with the preservance helps in uh, discovering the many aspects. Uh, uh, Professor Pierre uh, Vasudra, Vice Chancellor of HBNI, covered nicely the historic aspects of uh, discovery radioactivity. He started from well, uh, before the uh, discovery of radioactivity, in, uh, he talked about the various uh, development in 19th century and uh, also in 20th centuries. Uh, I'm quite sure he has taken all of you uh, to the event uh, that happened on 1st March uh, 1896, and most of you might have felt that you are witnessing the events in, uh, on 1st March 1896, and subsequently uh, how this field has been uh, uh, gone to the uh, modern era with the uh, research from uh, um, uh, Rutherford and Saudi and other things. He explained very nicely all of this aspect. Uh, uh, although the discovery of radioactivity was the first step uh, to understand the spontaneous emission of a radiation from nucleus of an atom, the subsequent final work by many great physicists, chemists, and of course technical inputs from engineers made the path uh, for the modern nuclear physics. Uh, Professor Martins uh, from CNRS University, Paris, Saclay, taken all of us from the discovery of radioactivity to modern day nuclear physics. Mentioning on the way, the great research and inventions by some of the best brains in the uh, 20th century. Uh, radio chemistry research at DAE has played an important role in the development of nuclear energy and other areas of nuclear technology, especially uh, isotope productions, uh, uh, nuclear pure cycles, and other activities. Uh, Starting with a small activity, uh, as uh, Professor uh, uh, Venukova Rao mentioned, uh, it is now a full price activities, uh, not only at uh, BRC, but also at IGCAR and also in some universities, but mainly at BRC in a radiological laboratory and IGCAR uh, chemistry groups. Uh, in fact, uh, a, a high radi uh, energy radiation and radioactive material needs a very careful and safe handling for their use in various technology applications. As you can see, that uh, we have seen that uh, uh, most of the early workers in radio uh, uh, radioactivity have yeah, suffered uh, many uh, health issues only because of their exposure to high radiations and other things. So safety is the, one of the most important part in uh, radiochemical research. Uh, 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 Dr. A. R. Sindharajan, former director, Radiation Safety Division, ARB, covered risk factors of radiation exposures and uh, evaluation of uh, radiation safety standards uh, 
right from its beginning and how the uh, exposure has been uh, limited so that uh, it is not uh, detrimental to the uh, 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 persons who are working the radioactivity. Uh, it is my uh, privilege to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion to all dignitaries who shaped these programs and all participants who made this program a great success. Sikhen uh, Vyas, uh, Chairman, uh, Council Management, HVNI, and Secretary D presided the event to commemorate 125 years of the discovery of radio, uh, radioactivity and address the participant. I, on behalf of HVNI and Organizing Committee, thank him for his keen interest in this event. I extend thanks to all the invited speakers, Professor P. R. Vasudev Rao, Professor Martins, Professor Sundar Rajan, Professor Dr. Venugopal for delivering the mesmerizing talks at today's events. This event is hosted jointly by INCAS and HBI 9. I would like to thank all executive committees of INCAS, uh, President uh, Professor B. S. Tomer, and also present uh, 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 Director uh, uh, Radio Chemist and Asur Group P. K. Pujari for uh, helping us to mold this program. Uh, we are uh, uh, fortunate to enough to be backed by HBNI Center Office functionaries, a team of very dedicated IC resources who know their task, and my sincere thanks to all the persons who have helped us to uh, make this uh, program a great, a great success. I especially uh, thank all the online and distributed participants. Uh, I also thank uh, Professor A.S. Banerjee, our Chancellor, who has come over here and witnessed the programs. And uh, all uh, dignitaries, I can see many, uh, but uh, I will not name one by one because of our time is limited uh, times. Because uh, uh, I thank all the dignitaries who attended this program online, and all the speakers again for their uh, mesmerizing uh, 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 talks on these occasions. It really it has helped to uh, uh, all the students, especially who are now entering into this uh, radio chemistry uh, research as well as those who are not maybe in doing the day, but to want to know uh, the research and how this progress had uh, happened uh, in last uh, 19th century, end of the 19th century and uh, 20th century beginning. And that has uh, shaped this uh, uh, radio chemistry as well as nuclear uh, physics in India as well as uh, uh, in the uh, uh, world. I thank you all once again. Thank you all once again, and we will close this meeting uh, at this point. And before we close, I once again personally thank uh, Dr. Martens for joining us from Paris, and Sri Sundar Rajan and Dr. Venugopal also for giving, uh, uh, sharing their perspectives and in a very, very interesting manner. The program has gone a little beyond the, the scheduled time, but I, I'm very glad that a number of participants have stayed back. and. Uh, I, I will, I'm sure that many more such events will be there through, through the year because the entire world will be celebrating this. Uh, but we are happy that uh, we could commemorate this uh, with this kind of program. Thank you, everybody, and bye.